evening and welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Good to have each and every one of you with us as we kick off December 2nd here on the big show. How y'all doing? Tell you, it's been an excellent week so far and it continues again tonight. Steve Ward is here. We're talking Mothman, Dogman, all sorts of cryptids tonight. So make sure you sit back, enjoy the way we normally would on this show because we are bringing some serious woo with us. Let's say hello to everyone in the chat room so far tonight. Snakes on a UFO in the gold medal position. We have gorgeous Cosmic Floor in the silver. Race fan with a rare bronze medal. Hi, James Horn. How you doing? Midnight Rider. Good to see you. Mennonite Abe. Nicola, nice to have you both here. Jeffrey DeRuin has returned. Grandpa Holland is here. He'll be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left of the studio, if you don't mind, to the left of the studio. Typical watch and Nikki, the gorgeous psychic from Seattle. How are you? Flippity bippity. Go 66. Boo. Todd Purden. Good to see you, my friend. Wes H. Eddie Haskell. Mama Susan. Always a pleasure to have you guys here. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Millennium and Double Tim. Double Tim will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the right of the studio. Big Willie, what's happening, buddy? Good to see you. The gorgeous Laura Elizabeth has returned. Hello, 405er. How are you, buddy? Good to see you. Luscious Jewels, nice to have you back. 5900 buck. good to see you, my friend. Uh, Michael Smith, a.k.a. Smithy, has returned. There he is, everyone. Give us a wave if you don't mind. Spooky Morales and his trumpet will be here start to finish as he closes out the show. Uh, Davy Jones Locker, good to see you, my friend. Thank you for coming on in. As we continue on here with Roll Call, Richard Elmore, good to have you here. Downshift, uh, Vash the Impaler, what is happening? Uh, Carfanibre, nice to see you. Sweet Donnie C, nice to have you back. Wolfman, good to have you here. The gorgeous Arlene Adkinzel has returned. The lovely Jessica McCreary is back. John Hudson, there he is. The fedora-wearing John Hudson right there. And uh, Good morning, Commonwealth Andrew, nice to have you here. Jose, what's happening, buddy? Good to see you. As we continue on, Ozzy, Ozzy, oi, oi to you, my friend. The gorgeous Canuck herself, Nicole Perron, is here. As we continue on with Roll Call, Dry Toast, the best name in YouTube, right there and in our chat room. The lovely Donna Corn has come on in. Project Blue Book, nice to have you here. We are caught up so far, and we're going to have a great show tonight, everyone. And uh, you know what? I'm. We were working on the audio last night, and we were working on it again tonight. So just bear with me. If if it's a little hot, we're going to try and improve on that. I got to figure out which dial to use and uh, we'll get it all sorted out. So there may be a little bit of audio technical issues here, but we will get it fixed. Not a problem. Good to have you all here tonight. Mothman, Dogman, Dave Man, Steve Man, the Audience Man, and the Women. We're all here. We're all here. Balut John, welcome to our channel for the first time. Thank you. Fargo, North Dakota. That's about as cold as I am right now. Uh, Phil Minervito, good to see you. Thank you for coming on in. Nightmare, nice to have you back. The gorgeous Divine Diamond, there she is. Trust me, she likes to wave, so make sure you wave back. There you go. All right, we better start the radio feed because that's kind of an important thing to do around here. And There we go. We got that set up. And uh, we are running there as well. Uh, all right. I don't know what the heck I'm doing here, but we're going to make it work. We are going to make it work tonight. And who else has joined us in the chat room? We're good in the chat room so far. That's good. Well, let's turn down that level a little bit. So 79. There we go. And uh, we got about 25 seconds. Trinitro, how are you? Sensational Sherry, nice to see you again. Look at that little guy, new grandson there. The gorgeous Sonia's News has returned. And remember, the Super Chat is open. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. Thank you to all the veterans who are tuning on in. We're going to rock here in just a few seconds. So sit back, relax, hi, gorgeous oracles. And do me a favor, get your horns up because it's time to rock. Right. 
from the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at spaced out radio, Instagram, spaced out radio show, and now on TikTok at spaced out radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. All right, let's hop right on to it. Steve Ward is here. He's been fascinated with the unexplained for over half a century. There were two events that really caught his attention growing up in Michigan. It was March of 1966 when the big UFO flap literally occurred over his backyard. But it wasn't until November of 1966 that really hooked, lined, and sinkered him into the world of the woo. And that happened in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, where the Mothman and its legend was born. He's been influenced by John Keel and the work of Jacques Vallée. Steve's views on UFOs became unconventional and moved more towards a paranormal explanation. He has visited Point Pleasant numerous times in his research and even dabbled in a little bit of Dog Man as well. I mean, this man is into everything, and we're going to get to him right now here on Spaced Out Radio. Steve Ward, how you doing, my friend? Uh, Excellent. Uh, Thanks for having me, Dave. Looking forward to it. We're very much looking forward to having you here as well. You know, 50 plus years of studying this (laughs) weird stuff, man. I mean, that's a long time to be in the world of the woo. Yeah, it is. Uh, I've always been, and I've not, I've had maybe one weird experience. I'm not one of these people that is an experiencer. As you know, you have many people on the show that have had something happen when they were young. Maybe they grew up in a haunted house or whatever, and it, it pulled them into this. I was, uh, I was a guy, a kid that was interested in science fiction and that sort of thing. Uh, eventually, I came across the, uh, the great anthologies of Frank Edwards. Uh, remember that guy? He was, a, uh, he was a, a news reporter, a journalist, and he became very intrigued by UFOs. He was a good friend to uh, Donald E. Kehoe, Major Kehoe, who was the head of NICAP back then, the, the National Investigations Committee on aerial phenomena. Well, Frank Edwards wrote these great anthologies called uh, Strange World, Strangest of All. And he, it's the first time I read about things like the Flatwoods Monsters or the uh, Kelly Hopkinsville Goblins. Um, the first time I ever heard anything about Bigfoot was in the chapters of one of his books. And the, the chapter was called The Monster Apes of Oregon. And I don't think he used the word Bigfoot, probably Sasquatch, but but uh, he was an early influence uh, before this great wave uh, of UFO sightings occurred in not just in Michigan, but throughout the Midwest in March of 1966. And there were a lot of uh, very credible people that saw these things, uh, police officers and so forth. And there was, uh, I, I grew up in the Detroit area and all around there, uh, Ann Arbor, Dexter, uh, Hillsdale, uh, people were seeing these things, sometimes landings. There was a famous one on the Frank Manor Farm in Dexter, which is just outside of Ann Arbor. And uh, Dr. Hynek, Dr. J. Allen Hynek at that time, was attached to Project Blue Book. And uh, while he had, uh, in recent years, started to be to be to begin to believe that this was really something legitimate, because he Hynek was an astronomer, uh, Northwestern University. Uh, he was hired by Blue Book as kind of a debunker. But as time went on, he found that uh, so many of these witnesses were credible and so many of the sightings. So he was there on the ground when all this happened. And uh, 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 Gerald Ford, who was a senator back then, became incensed at the way the the Air Force was not taking this seriously. So he got he uh, uh, originally actually Dr. Hynek asked them if they he wanted uh, if they wanted him to go and investigate. They said, no, don't worry about it. And then the senator stepped in and they sent him there the next day. So it, it was great. I was a kid in junior high. So all this stuff is going on in the newspapers and the uh, TV. And so uh, unfortunately, 
I didn't have any wheels to play UFO investigator, but it was a it was a really great time. I want to ask you because I am always interested in finding out these answers from people who've been doing this for more than half a century or forty years or more. How much has the game changed since you were in it? I mean, back back when you got started, you had to do everything by whatever the newspapers told you and by letter. And then you were probably waiting weeks and, and weeks for information to come in, even if it was talking to another another researcher just to get their phone number. And yet today, everything is at the click of a button. I, I realize how e- much easier it is today, obviously. But what was it like back then digging into this realm? Well, we, we didn't have the Internet, of course, but uh, we did have uh, that the 70s, for example, was a great time to be walking into a bookstore. Uh, you had all kinds of uh, magazines devoted to UFOs and, and the unexplained. Uh, so that was a that was a pretty great resource. And you don't you know, you just don't have that many print magazines anymore. <coughs> Excuse me. You also had something called the UFO News Clipping Service, which unfortunately uh, uh, it's been a few years since they've been publishing. But what they did was they uh, it started, I think it was Lucius Farish out of Arkansas that started it. And it changed hands a couple of times. But they would uh, they would gather, you know, a newspaper clipping services can be pretty expensive. But they would take pull in all these UFOs and paranormal uh, uh, sightings, newspaper clippings. And they would put them in a format where for five dollars a month, you would get a section on UFOs. It included a foreign section for uh, reports uh, all over the world and also a, a 14 section, uh, i.e. Charles Ford. So that was a great resource. And, then, and the one thing about that was every once in a while you would hear people say, well, we haven't heard much about UFOs for a while. Maybe they, they're not coming here anymore. Well, the mainstream media only pick would pick up a, a major UFO story every once in a while. I mean, you've got the Phoenix Lights, um, you've got uh, the uh, uh, the uh, in Chicago um, the the uh, airport. I can't think of the name of the airport right now. O'Hare Airport. Uh, O'Hare, Chicago. O'Hare, the bit famous sighting there. Every once in a while, they would pick up something. But if you subscribe to the newspaper or, uh, UFO news clipping service, you would find these things are going on all the time. It's just that they would seldom get beyond the local newspaper. So this phenomena is continuous. And uh, while, you know, the, the Internet is a great resource, I, I, miss the, I miss the days of being able to, to walk into those bookstores. I have quite a collection here of that old stuff that uh, I can use as a resource. <laughs> and also, uh, you know, many books from that era, too. But uh, the other thing that's changed is... And a lot of researchers have said this. We don't see as much in the way of what we would call metallic craft uh, touching down and so forth. Much of it seems to have changed to light ball phenomena, orbs, if you will, but not just not dust orbs from a uh, digital camera, but real light phenomena and, and strange things where the balls of light would separate and, and rejoin or whatever. So. There, there's still the, uh, the the old classic UFOs every once in a while. But, for example, uh, a uh, uh, Ted Phillips, who was a colleague of Dr. Heineck, Ted Phillips was uh, involved in what they called close encounters of the second kind, which dealt with uh, evidence, physical evidence, uh, landing marks, burn marks, uh, burnt branches, effects on people conjunctivitis, eye burn, and so forth. He, he investigated thousands of cases like that. Well, he discovered an area that he dubbed Marley Woods, and it's, it was in the south uh, uh, east corner of Missouri. Now, Ted Phillips, unfortunately, is no longer with us. But he was one of these people like me that he did, he did all kinds of investigations, much more than I ever had. And, uh, but then he got, got a line on this area in Missouri and he was actually there on the ground watching some of this phenomena take place. Now, there was also strange cryptid scene there. People had missing time and so forth. But he remarked how so much of the aerial phenomena, if you will, has had kind of changed from the classic flying saucer to balls of light and so forth. Again, 
there's always been a variety of different manifestations or whatever you want to call them. But <clears throat> but things have changed a bit. The other thing for me is back in the 60s, I was very, uh, very content with the idea that these uh, entities or whatever they were, were coming from other planets and landing here and you're taking soil samples and so forth and occasionally giving one of us a ride or an unscheduled medical exam. But being introduced to John Keel, Keel was one of the early ones to uh, discover that there seems to be connections between all of these things, uh, cryptids, UFOs, uh, psychic phenomena. He discovered that people were experiencing the same physical symptoms, conjunctive itis, uh, different kinds of ailments and so forth, whether they experienced a cryptid or some kind of a craft. And he found many other connections. But uh, I, I wasn't happy about that at the time. I read uh, his book. Well, uh, early on, I read uh, uh, Strange Creatures from Time and Space, which has been retitled um, The Guide to Mysterious Beings, and it's in trade paper size. That's where he first introduced the idea of windows, window areas, trying to come to grips with why is it that they, these things, Bigfoot or, or whatever, seem to sort of pop in, scare the hell out of people, leave footprints, and then they're gone? Um, but then a little bit later, he wrote a book called Operation Trojan Horse, which is sort of the granddaddy of, of his belief system. This is before uh, the Mothman prophecies. Excuse me a second. And... Uh, it was in Trojan Horse. I, I, I came, I wasn't, in fact, a friend of mine and I were kind of bad mouthing the book before we even read it because, you know, we thought, what's Keel doing connecting all this together? Because we were kind of happy with the, uh, our comfort zone. Or we had this paradigm where UFOs were separate, their own thing. Um, maybe there were cryptids out there. That was something separate. And, you know, ghostly phenomena or poltergeist phenomena was again separate. But Keel really demonstrated that and, and other really researchers have demonstrated that it really is all connected. It really is. And yet everybody wants to keep these phenomena segregated, Steve. You know, obviously you seem to have learned early on that there was connection between everything through the research that you were doing. You know, why do you think so many researchers out there fail to find that path? Um, it's, I, I don't know. I, I guess I, I look at myself because I, uh, I wasn't happy with the idea at first either, and uh, I had to, but the more people listen to the, the, the important, here's my, here's what I, when I get up and, and I do uh, some speaking, I get up on my, uh, my soapbox and I preach that we need to listen to the experiencers. We, we need, to need to listen to what they're telling us. Of course, we're always trying to assess the credibility of these people, but if we go in with preconceived ideas, and in fact, you, you know, I was just mentioning Stan Gordon uh, off the air. Yes. Good man. Uh, talk to Very Stan. Good yeah, man. excellent. He, he was. I was reading his stuff back in the seventies in, in UFO Report, and so we're about the same age. So we'll uh, we can uh, make each other feel old, I guess. But uh, uh, you know, he, he uh, <clears throat> uh, early on he made the connection between. Well, he did that. Uh, that there was that great wave in seventy three and seventy four in Southwest West Pennsylvania with very strange Bigfoot like creatures and, uh, uh, and, and, and UFOs and strange lights and so forth, which just doesn't uh, fit well with people. But uh, so, it, you know, no matter how you look at it, if you listen, uh, well, if, what I was getting at earlier, <clears throat> Stan told me that, uh, now he's done a lot more uh, investigating than I have, you know, one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews. And he would talk to some people that had uh, been with other investigators and they say they were, were asking about the Bigfoot they saw. And they said, well, you know what? I, I also saw this strange light land. No, nope, don't want to hear about your UFO. I want to know about Bigfoot and vice versa. They went sometimes people wanted to hear about they didn't want to hear them. You, you heard, saw a Bigfoot. I don't care about that. I want to hear about the spacecraft from Alpha Centauri. So there, there's a lot of that out there. And. You know, if people would look at, uh, take Ron Moorhead. Ron Moorhead is the one that uh, yes. he and his team went out to the Sierra Nevadas with Alan Berry, the uh, the skeptical journalist who became a believer. Uh, and they captured the great uh, um, uh, sounds, sounds of Bigfoot, the uh, Sierra sounds, they call them. 
Uh, he believed at first that Bigfoot was a flesh and blood creature. But then, and he wrote his first book, um, Voices in the Wilderness. And But as time went on, he would find that batteries would drain from his tape recorders and the camera. They would see strange lights in the woods. And Alan Barry, when he was still alive, uh, began to see this as well. But he didn't want Ron Moorhead to talk about that aspect. He, he thought it's hard enough to get the scientific community to believe that Bigfoots are a real unknown animal. Let's not add the weird stuff. But once Alan Barry passed, Ron Moorhead felt that he was free to come forth. He wrote the next book was Quantum Bigfoot. He's talking about quantum mechanics and these things, the way they sort of phase in and phase out. Tom Powell, another Bigfoot researcher, went through the same process. Uh, so many, uh, Jacques Vallée, uh, originally thought that UFOs were strictly nuts and bolts craft. But, you know, if you follow the reports, if you follow the experiences, not only do you find you, these connections and so forth, but there are so many interesting patterns and parallels with so many of these uh, areas. We, we were, you and I were talking a little bit off the air about these high strangeness areas, like, like where, where the Mothman was seen. There were all kinds of stuff going on around there. And, uh, you know, we, the Skinwalker Ranch is uh, in the news a lot. Uh, there are many, many of these areas of high strangeness or portals, whatever you want to label them, where these things all happen at the same place and they, they, they must be connected somehow. There must be some kind of a common denominator. I will tell you that we were in the forest here in British Columbia back in 2018 where we actually heard the talking and it wasn't until eight months later, I put it together and it was almost exact to what we were hearing on the Sierra sounds. Wow. Sort of that, they, they call it sometimes sort of like a, uh, samurai chatter. Yeah. Samurai chatter. And yes. also, um, Sally Shepard Wolford. She's the mother of the, of Autumn Williams, another famous Bigfoot researcher. She wrote a book called Valley of the Skookum. And it, it covered, uh, was like about 1973 to 1976. And that's when Autumn was uh, about three to six years old. And they, she talked about all the, you know, they saw in your face, flesh and blood Bigfoots. Uh, she would hear that kind of chatter at night near the cabin. And, you know, the, the, some of their trash cans would be knocked over and so forth. But they were also seeing things like, classic flying saucers, strange orange orbs following cars. There were even men in black showed up, some really weird dudes knocking on doors in this area. And, the, and some of the Bigfoots seem to glow at night and some seem to be translucent. You know, it just gets, it gets crazy. It really is, as we got about four and a half minutes to go before we got to go to break at the bottom of the hour. Steve Ward is our guest tonight. Steve, let's go back into your story here. As we, you know, when we come back from the break on the other side, we're going to get heavily into Mothman. What made you fall in love with this story? Well, it was the, uh, uh, the, the March 66, the following November, the same year, uh, there was this, this crazy report that came across the wire services. It went all over the world about this. And this is even before Mothman got a name. This winged humanoid chased two couples down Route 62, just north of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And, you know, as a kid, I just thought that was pretty cool. A little bit later on, I heard uh, James Mosley. He was the editor of Saucer News, which was one of the publications of the time. He was on, he was being interviewed on the old Joe Pine show. And for those who don't know who Joe Pine was, he was the uh, uh, great, uh, probably the first shock jock and he was uh, he was pretty rough on his uh, on his uh, guests but james mosley was talking about the mothman and then of course john keel started writing about it uh, years before he actually uh, uh, published the book the mothman prophecies which tells uh, a good part of the story so it's uh it was just very intriguing uh because of all the uh, i i was the guy that was there when the Mothman prophecies came out in hardcover with the dust jacket, it didn't sell very well when it came out, but I knew that baby was coming out. I had already been uh, uh, through Operation Trojan Horse. I had been uh, gone through, uh, I, I don't know, a, a ritual of fire in changing my thinking. And I couldn't wait to get my hands on that book. And the next year I took my first visit 
to Point Pleasant. Interesting. So for you, as you decided to make that trek to, to Point Pleasant, did you feel a calling or a pull that was leading you there? I, I, I just, you know, you, you read a book sometimes and you have to see the area. I didn't, so I didn't have much time. And I was visiting some friends south of uh, Buffalo, New York. So I drove down that uh, must have been Sunday and I uh, found the low hotel quite by accident in Point Pleasant. I had a map. I kind of knew where I was going. I was going to go out to what they call the TNT area where they first saw this thing. We can talk more about that later. But I, I just had this strong desire to see the area and uh, I just kind of put a vision to it, images to what I had read in the book. As you were going into West Virginia and, and decided to go to Point Pleasant, so we got about 90 seconds to go here before we got to go to break. Did you did you feel that you were you know going to see something? Did you or did you just feel it's like when disasters happen or or when something big happens, people just feel they need to go to that place or that area where an event took place just to feel it for themselves. Is that kind of what you were going through, or are you on a mission to try and get information? Uh, it was uh, information. Um, I, uh, I remember having kind of uh, I don't want to call them butterflies in my stomach, but I. Was, was doing this alone, and I didn't really know what, what I was going to find. Um, but, uh, and I, I wouldn't, wasn't going to talk to anybody, because this was only 10 years after the bridge tragedy, and we can talk about that later, too. But at the end of the, these events, uh, 13 months to the day when that, the couples saw I had that first sighting, the Silver Bridge collapsed and 46 people lost their lives. I didn't want to talk to somebody about the Mothman, like a fanboy or something like that, when perhaps they had lost a, a, a relative or a friend on the bridge. And there was a number of people who died in that that incident back then. And, you know, it's still celebrated to this day, but more of a tourism attraction now in Point Pleasant than it is about, you know, the, the macabre aspect of the funeral and or the multiple funerals that kind of went along with that event. Right. They have a uh, they do have a remembrance ceremony every year now. And I went to the 50th back in 2017. And actually, the next day I met one of the survivors, a truck driver that went down on the bridge and survived to tell the story. Wow. We're going to get you to hang on there. We're going to get more into Mothman, the history and what you've seen and learned over the years regarding the Mothman and the legend of this incredible story. All right. We are going to make sure that we have a good time tonight with all of our audience. Our guest, Steve Ward, Mothman, Dogman. He's been an encrypted and UFO investigator for over 50 years. We're going to pick his brain on the Mothman when we return on Spaced Out Radio. All right, we're clear. Okay. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig, founder of the... We are clear. That was a good half hour. Nice warm up there. This stuff, you know, you start at a point and it goes, can go off in all kinds of directions. It's not lateral. <laughs> it has, it has ripples that go everywhere. It's going to be amazing. I look forward to this. Look forward to this. What's that poster you have in there behind you? I, uh, <clears throat> there are tributes and spoofs of the old UFO report, like we were just talking about. Um, oh, nice. I made it, uh, it's a mock magazine cover. And this one is, was geared toward the Van Meter Visitor Festival. I made another one geared toward the Mothman Festival. And another one toward the Butler uh, conference. So what it is is it, it looks like, if you at first glance, it'll look like the old UFO magazines of the seventies. But I've got a bunch of names in here and a bunch of spoofs and uh, like Bray Road Tours, for example, with Linda. Yeah, Clark, nice. Right? A dial one eight hundred Gur. All right, and uh, I, I, all you know, all my friends and are in here being uh, poked fun at, and uh, so. Uh, you know, they come up with different ideas and 
And uh, those are awesome. Yeah, they're. Uh, you, need, you need to put those on the market. Well, what I've, I've done was I can. Uh, they're uh, they're pieced together. Each section I have several pieces of, so it takes a while, but I can I can piece several of them together. I have I have distributed. I have Jeff Wamsley of the, uh, the he's got one. His uh, daughter has one, and her husband. Uh, uh, several people, and of course, uh, some of the people that I have poked fun at in there, <laughs> they've got one too. So, uh, and I hope to do. I hope to do some more. I'd like to. Uh, it takes a long time to put them together, and of course, uh, color copiers are my friend when I do it. I use I use vinyl stick on lettering because I'm oh, not nice. uh, not adept at uh, I'm not a, not a draftsman where I can do this perfect lettering or anything. Yeah, me neither, man. But it takes, takes, well, it takes a long time with little tweezers. And it's fun getting the image of what I want to do and then figuring out how to do it. I, I turned uh, uh, a couple guys uh, that wrote the Van Meter Visitor. They look, made them look like men in black. <laughs> oh, perfect. Dastardly men in black. But they they have been silenced, is, was the article. By Kai, she was asking if you could show the amazing stories one oh, right on your yeah. left. This is one I made uh, quite a few years ago, and uh, I made a, a a model kit bashing from very different models. That's me. That's a two dimensional cutout of me balancing on the wing, and it's supposed to be me escaping from Atlantis while it's blowing up. So I I borrowed from calendars and uh, uh, made the thing myself. And uh, there's three awesome. dimensional elements and two dimensional elements. This was made about 20, 25 years ago, I think. So. That is wicked, and uh, I love I love the old I, I collect the old amazing stories. <clears throat> I uh, I spoke about the Shaver mystery um, at the Van Meter Visitor Festival. Uh, if you remember, Richard Shaver started hearing voices on his welding torch, and. Uh, claimed they were from the evil Darrow that lived deep beneath the earth and they would send these rays out from their ancient uh, mechanisms to uh, to uh, uh, it was kind of another devil theory they would uh, create right. car crashes and, and uh, make people stab each other and so forth <coughs> all right my friend we got one minute okay I'm glad the audio is working tonight it sounds really good on my end. Yeah, I had to uh, reroute everything here. I had to, my uh, my major uh, mi mixer that I had is now a twenty five hundred dollar paperweight. Wow. Yeah, so I had to reroute everything, and I think we got it cleaned up tonight. So that that's working. It's nice and clear, which is good. All right, we got about 30 seconds. I just want to say thank you to Smithy for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. So thank you very much to those who hit up on the Super Chat. Thank you to all our new subscribers as uh, we're encroaching already on 14,100. All the veterans out there, like our buddy veteran Surf Jair, much love. You always have a safe home here on Spaced Out Radio. For all our veterans, we love you. And to all our regulars, let's get ready. Here comes the second half hour. Second half hour of Space Down Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Space Down Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading up on Shirky Poo's news wire, and checking out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. 
We continue on with the cryptid talk as we're shifting gears, going right into Mothman and the prophecies and legends that go along with this strange creature. Giving us the history lesson right up to present is Steve Ward. And Steve, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, it's great to be here, Dave. A lot of fun. All right, let's go back to 1966. Let's take a brief history lesson here for those who may not know the full legend of the Mothman and the prophecies that went along with that. Fire away, 1966. November, November 15th, 1966. Um, the the uh, Scarberries and the Mallets, they were two married couples, and they were cruising through an area uh, uh, called the TNT area. Now, this... Uh, uh, it's it's now the uh, McClintic Wildlife Area, but back in the 40s, it was a. If you look at the old, if you can find the old black and white photographs online, it was a huge complex where they made TNT. They made with munitions for the World War II effort, and what they would do is store them in these concrete bunkers. Uh, they the locals just call them igloos. They're, they're like concrete igloos. There was a hundred of them. And what they would do is they would have uh, foliage growing all over them. So if, God forbid, the enemy got that far into the U.S., they could fly over them and it would just look just like terrain. They wouldn't know that all kinds of uh, uh, munitions and explosives were stored there. Well, long abandoned, in, in the, even in the 60s. Uh, this place is, uh, if you to go there in the daytime, it's creepy as hell. If you go there at night, it's really creepy. And I, uh, during the Mothman Festival, I give, I'm one of the tour guides and we they take, take, take three tractors and they, they pull three carts and uh, through the, uh, the TNT area. And it's a little bit set up like a Halloween hayride, uh, a guaranteed flyover of the Mothman with great special effects. But it, it, it's really quite an experience to, to go out there. And uh, back in the old days, you could drive in there. You can't do that now. All the the roads are blocked off. You can you can walk in, but uh, uh, so they were actually uh, it was a it was sort of a lover's lane uh, out there, and uh, the the scarberries and the mallets who go out there and have a little fun sometimes sneak up behind a a couple in a in a warm embrace and f flash their headlights on them. So uh, anyway, they didn't didn't find anybody they were looking for. And they were going by the old North power plant and they saw something, some kind of a, a shadow, an image, something. And it got closer and it was humanoid. It had wings. Linda Scarberry said it looked like one of its wings was caught in the fence. And the really striking part of it was it had these piercing red glowing eyes, not eye shine, but something that seemed to generate its own light. And they, they decided to get the hell out of there. They took off. But it followed them, they said. It flew through the air, keeping pace with their car. And they, they came down into Point Pleasant. They did stop at the police station and, and, and gave the report. The, uh, the police chief said that he'd known these kids all their life. They seemed to be genuinely frightened. If you go to the Mothman, now Jeff Wamsley, who uh, was the co-founder of the Mothman Festival, which is every third weekend in September, uh, he's, uh, he's also... Uh, uh, created this just, just wonderful museum, the Mothman Museum. It is so well done. Uh, you know, there, there's great merchandise there. There's nothing, nothing you know, cheap about it. I mean, it's just the very high quality. He has memorabilia from the the film, The Mothman Prophecies, but he also has all these articles uh, of of the of the uh, of all the occurrences of all the reports at the time, including Mary Heyer's column, Where the Waters Mingle. Mary Heyer was the reporter that uh, became a friend and colleague of John Keel. And they would go down uh, south of there and watch the strange lights go over every night. But uh, you also will find the original written report from the couples that saw this thing. And uh, so it's it's just a, it is just so well put together. Uh, now, of course, it, it hit this hit the wire services. Uh, it wasn't called Mothman right away. We don't know who came up with the term, but the TV show Batman was popular at the time. So somebody just made a play on that because whatever this thing was, it didn't look anything like a moth. It had had a wingspan of about roughly ten feet, 
He was about six, seven foot tall, uh, roughly humanoid. Um, yeah, the thing is that uh, I'll go a little bit more on with the story, but early on, you can see that the Mothman was a paradox. Um, a 10 foot wingspan probably wasn't enough to lift something that big, although it did take off. It didn't always flap its wings. People would see it standing there, put its wings behind it, and take off straight up like a helicopter. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, in, in some cases, it seemed to leave some kind of a footprint. John Keel saw these skinny little footprints uh, around the uh, the old North Power Plant. And, and what, sorry for cutting yes, you off. What did sure. those footprints look like? Uh, he didn't didn't give much of a of a description. They were just kind of long and narrow. Uh, the thing is, he found other footprints there, which kind of reflect more on what's going on today. He found, and I and I I didn't you know catch this at first. He found these large dog-like footprints in the same area, and he said whatever it was making this was had to be really heavy because they were pressed in so deep. He was guessing something that was three or four hundred pounds. It sounds like a six-foot dog man, you know. He also found there was another. Uh, 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 I was mentioning before off air. These things don't happen in a vacuum. It's like you've got the Mothman and hitting the water, and then you've got all these ripples of all these other things that happen at the same time. Um, uh, he, uh, I just lost my train of thought there. What did you just ask me? Oh, just in regards to the footprints, what, what they yes. look like. Yes, okay, yeah. I, uh, uh, he also, there was a, uh, a, a really bizarre sighting closer to Charleston of a sort of a retro UFO. So it's kind of classic saucer shape. A guy named Tad Jones saw it uh, on his way to work in uh, Cross Lanes. And it, uh, it had uh, rods that sort of came down, something like caster wheels on the bottom and a propeller on the bottom. Now, what the hell is this thing? Um, and some kind of an old uh, you know, a drone or something. And so he sees this thing. John Keel goes out to investigate. He finds the same weird Mothman-like footprints, if it was Mothman, and he also finds these large dog-like footprints. He consults with Ivan Sanderson. Now, most people know who he was. He was the, the great British naturalist. He was living in New Jersey, friend and colleague of John Keel. Um, he wrote the, uh, the Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life, and many great books on UFOs. He also concurred. He said, we, we keep finding these footprints, these dog-like footprints in these paranormal hotspots. And that's mentioned in the Mothman prophecies, but we it's frustrating because we don't have any more information than that. I wish these people were still alive so we could, you know, the, the, the dog-man phenomenon didn't really come to the forefront until, uh, until Linda Godfrey started writing about it with the Beast yes. of Bray Road. Uh, I heard a report from a... Uh, a professor, retired Wayne State University professor at Michigan MUFON. He talked about his investigation into Bigfoot and uh, and UFOs in Michigan. He didn't, he was, the report wasn't really for public consumption, but he, one thing he did say that I can share, he said that we keep finding these dog-like footprints in these paranormal hotspots. And I think that's, that happened, you know, we've got these different researchers separated by half a century telling us that these, footprints keep showing up what might that tell us about the dog man but but back to uh mothman um john keel also got some reports of some people that saw it fairly close and it sounded like it was making some kind of a humming noise or or motor noise or something as if it was mechanical or maybe it was a drone so how do you piece all these things together something that sort of an apparition sort of a physical entity maybe mechanical i you know so many of these things um don't seem to make sense if we listen to the reports it'd be very easy just to ignore the stuff we don't want to hear but whatever this thing was uh was and, and the other thing that makes it kind of puts it in the realm of the paranormal john keel discovered this but there was also a swedish researcher whose name escapes me he was another friend and colleague of john keel john keel uh, went over to Sweden at one time and spent some time with these uh, great researchers. But this one gentleman uh, interviewed even more 
uh, uh, witnesses of the Mothman than John Keel did. And almost all of them had an outbreak of poltergeist phenomena after they got home. Uh, there have been reports of people, you know, having a close proximity with a UFO and maybe nothing else, and also having that kind of an outbreak. What possible connection? You know, you, it, you just have to wonder, how is it that, what's the connection? What makes that happen? And it makes it seem that there's something more to Mothman than just an undocumented creature. So fast forward to today, where we see these creatures popping up in Indiana, in Illinois. Lon Strickler, Butch Wachowski have done a lot of work on these these creatures. Eric Altman has also joined in. And we'll get back to the history in a minute. But is do you think this is a different creature that we are dealing with today that people are encountering compared to what was happening in 1966? Yeah, I think I think so. I, I some I'm a little skeptical of some of those sightings. I know I have a couple sources from MUFON that uh, some of the early sightings were coming from the same IP address. So I think there's it's, we have to be very careful because sometimes there's a mixture of legitimate reports and then reports that are fabricated. I but to answer your question, I tend to think that you know so many times people will. Uh, they'll, they'll talk about some kind of a winged creature, whatever it is. Well, it's the Mothman. Well, the Mothman, whatever it was, even if it was an apparition of some kind, had kind of a specific look to it. Uh, there was the uh, Linda Godfrey uh, investigated the what they called the Wisconsin man bat that goes back to uh, I can't I, I don't remember what year it was, but it's the last 10 or 15 years. And that was something very different. It was like a big, ugly bat. It came very close to the window. The father and son saw this thing. It didn't look like anything they'd ever seen before. And they both became very ill afterwards. There was some kind of a real negative effect to it. So I think we have to, there was the uh, years ago in the 50s, I think there was the Houston Batman. There are other birds that kind of fall more in the Thunderbird category. Uh, so I'm a little hesitant to say it's the same thing. The only the only report that actually looked a good deal like the Mothman happened almost exactly three years before the Scarberries and the Mallets had their sighting in the TNT area. And that we have to go to Kent, England. Uh, Kent, England, uh, there were some uh, kids coming home from a dance. They uh, saw a strange light uh, land down behind a grove of trees. And then they saw another light, and it's not clear, but the light may have morphed into this thing. And it was, it shuffled it like the Mothman did when the Mothman, when, they, when the Scarberries and the Malice first saw it, it was kind of shuffling on the ground. This thing did the same thing. This thing didn't look like it had a head. A Mothman, the eyes were kind of sunken down in the chest, it seemed, or, or you know, nobody really got a very good look at it. So that was that that was actually, except it didn't, they didn't report anything about the eyes. The eyes did not have that red glow, but it was remarkably similar in that one case. So, you know, uh, Keel, Keel wasn't sure how, uh, how physical these things were. He thought perhaps they were uh, temporal or paraphysical and that they may have all come from the same source. He, he wasn't that concerned about what the creature looked like or how many portholes the spacecraft had. He thought that perhaps these were uh, transmogrifications of energy. They may have been temporal. If, if you look at some of these uh, the sightings over the years, there does seem to be kind of a reflective factor. I mean, the, the airship reports from the late 1800s. Uh, and then, you know, later on, we had the, uh, some of the strange lights, the, uh, the, the, the uh, ghost planes and, uh, and the scare ships and so forth, and the Foo Fighters, uh, and then classic UFOs. It was like a lot of these, uh, even some of these strange uh, ghost planes that they were seeing in Sweden. They were these huge planes that would come out of the north and they would have many propellers and, and they shoot on these big spotlights down to these little villages way up north. And they wonder, where the heck do these things come from? Where, you know, where would they get be refueled or whatever? And it just seems like the a lot of these things were, call them manifestations or whatever, were a little bit ahead of where we were scientifically. 
uh, when the air, we saw these airships, they they were like these big dirigibles with lights and wheels and and so forth. Uh, they uh, uh, there wasn't you know I mean there wasn't anything really that far advanced. The uh, zeppelins and, and that sort of thing, dirigibles, were in, in the infant, infancy stage. So there's a very strange uh, uh, connection between. Uh, I think our belief and our expectations for some of these, it doesn't, Keel wasn't saying that they were, people were hallucinating. There was a, a physical reality to these, but there was something very strange about the way they would manifest over the years. After the incident where the Silver Bridge collapsed and I believe it killed 46 people. Yes. 47, 47 people in there. You know, people had claimed and the stories start going around that, oh, the Mothman was seen tampering with the bridge or standing on top of the bridge as it collapsed and so on and so forth. And, you know, this is where tall tales kind of come into play because yeah. everybody wants an excuse. Do well, you think that really happened? I, I don't, you know, I, I'm, I'm always skeptical because there have been other bridge collapse uh, bridge collapses and sometimes after the fact you'll hear oh somebody saw this winged creature before and you know i i don't know i uh, there was a flash when the bridge collapsed and some people claimed it was a ufo uh keel believed it was the power cables were, were breaking and then there was there was just an electrical arc it was the 13th eye bar that failed it was a, it was a defect and the bridge wasn't really, uh, it was uh, constructed back in the 1920s. It wasn't really meant to carry the traffic of the 1960s. And uh, so I, uh, the, the one thing, uh, somebody did report to Mary Heyer that they'd seen two men climbing around on the bridge. They were kind of in uh, like dress clothes. I mean, they weren't, didn't have coats on. They had uh, street shoes on and checkered shirts. <laughs> And, you know, maybe there's nothing to that, but there's a there's a really bizarre phenomenon that I first read about it with Keel. And then when I've talked to other people, I found <laughs> there's something to it. The man in the checkered shirt phenomenon. You know, we we hear about these bedroom invaders. In fact, Mothman was a bedroom invader in some cases, which throws another wrench into the physical creature aspect. But uh, and Keel would talk about how, you know, the, the uh, people would have the, these apparitions by their bed, and sometimes this it would be a man, and he'd be wearing a checkered shirt. Well, I thought that's weird. I and then one time my my wife and I were down south visiting her uncle. He had a lady friend over, and we just you know how people get talking about ghost stories and the paranormal. She knew nothing about the literature, and she was talking about how she saw this man at the foot of her bed at one night, and then she had this puzzled look on her face, and she said. It was weird. He was wearing a checkered shirt. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> you know, and that was without any solicitation to try and, and get that out of her. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, there are some people that think that Mothman was a harbinger. It was somehow warning about the bridge. Well, I wish these harbingers would be a little clearer about what's going to happen. You know, you see an app, if, if he was a harbinger and an apparition, how would we, you know, Keel? believed something was going to happen, but there were other reasons for it. Uh, Mary Heyer and, and, and some one of the other Mothman witnesses, uh, Mrs. Tomlinson, they were having a, a, uh, a dreams of, of uh, packages floating on the, on the river. And of course, this is leading up to Christmas. And of course, that's exactly what happened when the bridge collapsed. Um, uh, John Keel, the, the Mothman Prophecies is a fascinating book. <laughs> but excuse me, I want to I want to warn something, though, uh, to warn people. Um, the original manuscript uh, that the editors cut half of it out. Uh, there was some tampering with it. There are some some mistakes in the in the Mothman prophecies. I don't think uh, we can we can put them all on keel. There's a couple places where it looks like the editors wanted to make uh, some of the Mothman sightings a little more uniform. Because when you see other articles that, that John Keel wrote about the same incident, it's accurate. In the in a couple of things in the Mothman prophecies are tweaked a little bit. So the it was cut out by half. Uh, a lot of that was preserved in his next book, The Eighth Tower. So that was good. But uh, uh, it's uh, 
it's just a, a fascinating story. But he got involved with several people that were, he called them silent contactees. These people were, they firmly believed they were in contact with some kind of an entity, like, like a space brother or whatever. And they had no desire to uh, draw attention to themselves or to tell people about it. They firmly believed they were having this contact. A lot of times they would be given some kind of a goal to achieve, which was unachievable, like trying to find a mysterious cross in Brooklyn. Uh, sometimes they were given prophecies. That's where the, the title comes from. And sometimes they became true, maybe a plane crash or whatever. But then the big one, you know, oh, it, the world's going to end. Uh, if you go to this hill and gather all your friends together, the Space Brothers will come down and they'll save you. And, of course, no Space Brothers. And they these people were led along by whatever trickster force this was. So the same thing. Now, at one point, John Keel, was he, he was in contact with a lot of these people that didn't know each other. And they're talking about some big event. And Keel began to believe it was going to be something about the river, but he thought maybe a factory or something was going to explode. He told Mary Heyer, don't tell anybody about this, because if it does happen, they're going to come to us and think that we had something to do with it. He was didn't even think about the bridge. And uh, uh, and, and then they, 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 got, they got more and more detailed as time went on. They were saying it was going to be some kind of a big EM effect, whatever that meant. And it was going to happen. Finally, they got the date. It was going to happen December 15th, 1967, the moment President Johnson lit the Christmas tree in Rockefeller Center. And there would be power failures, three days of darkness. I think uh, that the Pope was going to be assassinated. Um, yeah, that might have been another time. But uh, so by this time, Keel was had been so immersed in this and seeing some of these things come true. And he was being harassed. There were a lot of bizarre. There was a lot of it was actually human intervention. The IRS was messing with him, and uh, the feds apparently. Uh, a lot of people don't know this, but at one point he wrote a very critical article on J. Edgar Hoover. A couple of weeks later, right. he started getting all this harassment. Some of that harassment is detailed in the Mothman prophecies, and it's not paranormal. It's not the Space Brothers. It's the damn government. But. Uh, so Keel is in his New York apartment. He wasn't in Point Pleasant when the bridge collapsed. He was there. He said he bought it hook, line, and sinker. He was a raving paranoiac. And he's there with uh, in his apartment with his, with extra water and everything. Steve, yes. I'm going to get you hold on right there. We're going to continue okay. the Mothman talk when we return with investigator Steve Ward. He's been into cryptids and UFOs for over half a century. This man knows things, and we're glad to have him here on Spaced Out Radio tonight. We'll continue with the Mothman talk and get prophetic next on the Mighty SOR. All right, we're clear. Good place to leave it. It's good stuff, good man. Good stuff. I know it's... Uh... <clears throat> you can rein me in any time. Like when you, when you start talking about this, it's very easy to take all these detours and meander around because all these things seem to connect. Oh yeah, I'm I'm enjoying it very much. <clears throat> we got about five and a half minutes. Okay. So nice time to relax here. <clears throat> I can also tell you about the uh, Bill Edmondson, the survivor, if you want, that night on the bridge. Yeah, let's, we'll get into him for sure. Okay. See if anything important is going on in my life here. Nope. Me either. I'm just hanging out doing a radio show. 
<laughs> I uh, have done several shows on uh, Bray Road and the Dog Man. Yes. Uh, connected one way or the other. And also uh, a lot of weird stuff going on in southern Wisconsin as well. So UFO wise or cryptid wise? Yeah, every yeah, but both. Uh, uh, may, really? Mostly cryptid, but but like I say, Lee Hample's farm is just uh, it's just crazy, and this stuff's going on all the time. And if he hadn't put those cameras up, nobody'd know about it because uh, and you can see the timestamp on some of these things, so you know how quickly some of these things fade in and fade out. Also, he has he's dropped carcasses there, like deer carcasses or whatever. And you'll see this mist show up. And then, you know, sometime later, uh, there'd be another picture. And the carcass is gone. No footprints, no drag marks. The, he's been chronicling these footprints, five-toed, a pad, and a heel. And they're all over the place. And they do crazy things like start in the middle of nowhere or maybe end in the middle of nowhere in the snow. And he's given these photographs to the DNR and experts and so forth. One woman called him a liar, that he's just making this up. Somebody else said that, uh, well, it's it's a double footprint. He said, well, these footprints are all over the place. You know, how can you have a, a, a double footprint to go on for hundreds of yards? Um, it's just, it's mind-blowing. I think there's these little skinwalker farms all over the place. That, that, yes, absolutely. You know, my friend in Mission, British Columbia, used to live on one. Really, they had they had everything going on there. The, our Bigfoot sightings happened there. Yeah. Our UFO sightings, alien sightings happened there. <laughs> Ghost sightings, fairies. They had everything going on there, and and uh, all the other properties, as far as we knew, were silent. Nobody said a thing, you know. But this one piece of property was just crazy, crazy. Well, there are some people around Bray Road that won't talk about this at all. He's got a neighbor that uh, doesn't like him at all and won't. Uh, he wanted he asked if he could put cameras on her property, and she said some pretty nasty things to him. We won't we won't talk about that on the air, but uh, but other but some of the other people, you know, they were the ones that told him. He said, you know, you got there's something on your on your property, you know, and uh, and mm -hmm. we've seen it, and it's just at this one yeah. end of Bray Road. That's crazy. That is crazy. We got about two minutes here. Okay. <clears throat> That's just nuts. And you try to you try to come to grips with the, you know, we we, we uh, as ra rational human beings, if that's what we are, doesn't seem like it, but uh, we try to we try to put it together. You know, A B C. And man, it just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. There's a real sort of a trickster element, a mischievous element to so much of this. <coughs> Allergies. All right, we got about... Uh... One minute, 20 seconds. Okay. Hi, gorgeous Amy Vegas O. How are you? Amy's well, very a fan. Nice. Thank you very much. Chad Smith, the Chad Smith has arrived, people. Oh, hey, Clam. How you doing? Brazelhoff, good to see you. Um, Manuel, no, I haven't seen Carl in a couple of years. Chris Mo in Austria, good morning to you. How are you? I wonder if my friend Jocko is out there. Oh, probably somewhere. Probably somewhere. There's 165 watching live right now. So, oh, all right, deal. TMI, good to see you. Uh, Smithy, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. It's a great way to support what we do nightly here on Spaced Out Radio. We appreciate each and every one. So thank you very much. Thank you to all our new subscribers who've hit that subscribe button and rang that bell. And all the veterans who are tuning us in, 
We appreciate you. Here we go with our number two. Horns up, people. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Hour number two of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Tanacles. Tanacles is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on with legendary researcher Steve Ward, over 50 years looking into everything from cryptids to UFOs, extraterrestrial contact. Mothman is the topic. Dogman coming up in just a little bit. Steve, welcome back. Uh, great to be back, uh, Dave. That might be the first time I've been called legendary. Well, why not? Why not? <laughs> nice, nice, high and tight beard like that. You totally deserve it, my friend. Oh, you you. Totally deserve it. We like a good solid beard around here. I want to ask you before we continue on, do you believe in Mothman? Yes. Uh, uh, there were a uh, John Keel talked to a little over 100 people in that year that saw something. Most of the reports were the same, you know, same general uh, that the co- dark coloring about the same size, uh, humanoid wings, red glowing eyes. Now there were people, you know, in these in these areas, these hot spots, people always will see other things. A very famous witness, Tom Urey, and his report is incorrect in the Mothman prophecies. Tom actually saw a thunderbird. The thing, this thing had a uh, uh, ten to twelve foot wingspan. And it was just a giant bird. He said, look, it was not a condor. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. I would take a lie detector test. You know, I met, uh, I was able to meet some of the original uh, witnesses of of the Mothman at the Mothman Festival. Jack was able to get some of them together. And they, they were at a table. Linda Scarberry, now she's no longer with us, but I was able to talk to her one-on-one. Uh, Faye DeWitt, who is not mentioned in the book. Uh, she had a close-up sighting of the uh, of the Mothman, and Tom Urey was there. Now, uh, Tom Urey, uh, his there was something. Mary Heyer wrote about his sighting in in the uh, in her column. Now she got some. I think, if I remember correctly, she implied that it had come from the TNT area or something like that, but it, it didn't really. Uh, she colored it up a little bit. And uh, Tom wasn't didn't appreciate that. Now they were friends, Tom, Yuri, and Mary Heyer. But he told me now he told me the story several years ago, about about forty years after the fact, I guess. Uh, he said he went in and talked to Mary. He said, "Mary, I ought to kill you," you know, joking, of course. And she said, "Don't worry, Tom. This will all blow over in about two weeks." Well, here it is, four decades later, and it had not blown over at all. But the point is that, and, and he thought, when Tom Urey, when I talked to him, he had not met Linda Scarberry until that day. He had not met Faye DeWitt. You know, we think all these people live in the same area. They all saw the Mothman. They all know each other. It's not true at all. He thought that they were seeing the same thing he did, only they were just so freaked out by it. They they colored up the details or 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 just imagined something scarier than a big bird. Well, he was, uh, you know, they made the, the film, The Mothman Prophecy, in about 2002. And Tom Urey and one of the other witnesses who I never met, uh, Marcella Bennett, she's the one in The Mothman Prophecies where she and her brother went out to, they'd heard about the Mothman. They were going to go out and, and try and scare some people that they had didn't be home. They weren't home. But she saw this thing rose up out of the ground, off the ground, and she dropped her infant child for a moment 
she, oh she, the child was all right, but she was so terrified of this thing and it took off. So Tom Urie and Marcella Bennett were driving out to some kind of a uh, some some kind of a filming they were going to do in Catanning, Pennsylvania, where they actually they actually doubled for Point Pleasant in the film. And so he said, and he, he was telling me the story. He said, "Okay, I'll tell you my story. You tell me yours." And after he heard her story, he was convinced that no, they didn't see the same thing he did. They saw something distinctly different because it, it wasn't just a matter of imagination. So. To answer your question, uh, a little over 100 people saw this thing, very similar. They experienced something, even though it just doesn't make any sense. You know, it doesn't flap its wings, took off straight like a helicopter. It generated its own lights with its eyes, had a motor sound in some cases. It just doesn't fit. Marty wants to know, in your opinion, Steve, what kind of being is the Mothman? I don't know. Perhaps uh, what we might call an elemental. Um, John Keel used the term uh, ultra terrestrial, and he used it as kind of a literary device. But the idea was that some of these entities, uh, even some of the ones that we think might come from outer space, that perhaps these these things, these images, are a natural condition of the planet. Now he also would use the term ultra terrestrial. Uh, uh, as a synonym for elemental. And elementals, of course, are the little people, the fairies, the, the leprechauns, the uh, pan, uh, the Cherokee little people, and, and on and on. Uh, so it, it fits something more like that. It, it doesn't, it, it didn't obey physical laws, um, yet it seemed to have some physicality. Perhaps Keel was right. Perhaps these were simply some kind of a transmogrification of energy, something temporarily physical. Um, they're almost like something out of a nightmare. You know, there was a, uh, I saw as somebody mentioned earlier uh, on uh, the blurb across the screen that uh, uh, they or a friend of theirs had seen one in their bedroom. Well, a, a woman uh, named Pat Gray, she spoke at the festival at one time and I spoke to her one-on-one. She and her husband were missionaries. And when they, just at the, on the verge of the Mothman wave, they went off to some far off country as missionaries. But before they went, they had this apparition that looked just like the Mothman, big uh, humanoid thing with wings and red glowing eyes manifesting right in their bedroom. So they went off for years. When they came back years later, they started reading, they were completely out of touch with their hometown. Years later, they start reading all these things about the Mothman. They thought, my God, that's what we saw manifest in our bedroom. So another element of the Mothman to make it not, not permanently physical. So I guess, I guess I'm going to have to say it's some kind of a elemental, uh, a thought form, perhaps. Uh, you know, it might be, I, I like the term I like is called, is the phantom menagerie. That was coined by uh, Dr. Donald Allman. He was a, a, uh, a, uh, a uh, of the Church of England. He was an exorcist. He actually uh, attempted to exorcise the Loch Ness monster. That's another great story. I remember uh, that. Yes, and he even uh, supposedly exorcised the Bermuda Triangle. So this guy was no slouch, right? But uh, so I, I guess, I guess I will have to see if I'm going to go out on, out on a limb some kind of an elemental perhaps something, but something natural to the planet that we just don't understand. But, uh, you know, I'm definitely, John Keel himself wouldn't be able to tell you what the Mothman was. He didn't know. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed, because I mean, so many people having seen the exact same thing, it's not like a Bigfoot where, you know, some see a dark red, some see a gray, some see a black or a dark brown, or even a blondish, long hair, short hair. I mean, everybody who has seen this creature has continued to see the exact same thing. I mean, that's almost unprescribed in the cryptid world. Well, let me give you something else about Bigfoot. Um, Stan Gordon has run into some of these cases, but the classic one of all time, well, that's an exaggeration, but 19, oh, come on, 66, 
near Marlington, West Virginia, near the state forest there, a, a gentleman named Dr. Uh, no, W.D. Priestley, Doc Priestley was his nickname, Doc. He's driving along in his car. He's following a uh, hunting bus. He and his buddies are uh, off on an excursion, uh, caravan style. All of a sudden, Priestley's car goes to a stall and just cruises to a stop. He looks over to his left, and there's a classic Bigfoot standing there. And its hair occasionally seems to be standing on end a little bit, like static electricity. So he's, he's agape. He doesn't know how long he's there, but his buddies notice he's not behind him. They turn around, they come back. The Bigfoot sees them coming or hears them coming and recedes back into the woods. Priestley is able to start his car again. So he takes off and he's, he doesn't tell anybody what happened. He takes off and all of a sudden, I don't know how far he got, but his car starts to chug and it, and smoke is coming out of his engine. His engine burns out. What's off to his left again? Either the same Bigfoot or his kissing cousin is standing there in proximity. There are cases where cryptids, the proximity of cryptids, seem to affect the engines of vehicles in the same way that UFOs do. We have many, many cases of a close proximity of some kind of a craft uh, seeming to stall a uh, car. Now, <laughs> Priestley didn't tell anybody for months later what happened because he, he wanted he wanted to come back to that area and go hunting. He wanted his buddies to come with him. He wasn't going to tell them that he saw a Bigfoot to scare the hell out of him. So he told them afterwards, after the hunting uh, took place, guess what happened to me? Uh, Stan Gordon has, uh, has chronicled a couple of these. But just to kind of show you that there's these patterns, um, in 1960, in uh, North North uh, North Cumberland, England, Dorothy Strong is in a taxi cab. They're cruising along. Taxi cab stalls. What they see is a, a literally a phantom army. And you know we've heard of phantom armies in Gettysburg. They pop up in England sometimes and other places. And they're marching toward the the uh, taxi cab which has stalled the fare meter has gone crazy and they feel like they're they're being hit by a force field of something and as this army comes toward them they fade out it doesn't last very long they dissipate the uh, taxi cab is able to start again it's from, it was the battle of of otterburn from 1388 now, the reason they know that is because this thing has manifested before, and they can tell by the uniforms. They could see them in detail enough to know back in history what this was all about. So here you have a Bigfoot. You have a, uh, uh, a phantom army, and you have you know all these cases of UFOs that interact with vehicles somehow. Um, you know, if, if a... If people can be in a haunted house and an apparition can drain their batteries, I suppose an apparition the size of an army could stall a car. It doesn't, you know, it kind of follows logically. But, uh, and there's even a crazier one if you want to hear it that deals with the, the fairies, the little people. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's my favorite vehicle stoppage of all time. Uh, Elliot O'Donnell, he was a, uh, well, he was a paranormal investigator of his time. He wrote books in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and he had uh, one was called Ghostland. And this this story was about his uncle uh, by marriage. And uh, he was uh, driving in a cart with his uh, his servant named Dunkley. Right. And they're on a haunted road going toward Limerick in Ireland. And all of a sudden now they're, it's, they're in a horse drawn carriage, one horse. All of a sudden the carriage stops dead. The horse is shivering. And Mr. B, who is, was his uncle, uh, turns around and he sees Dunkley is in a state of, in a, he's in a stupor. He's got a look of terror on his face. Mr. B looks down, he sees these little shadowy forms swarming. And so he grabs the reins, breaks the spell. They take off. They get far enough away. Dunkley comes out of his stupor and he said, what happened? What did you see? In his mind's eye, he saw a troop of dancing fairies. And apparently when you come upon the fairies making merry, they don't like it. They don't want to be seen. So again, from his viewpoint, these things were looked angry. They were climbing on the cart and they're trying to pour this guy off, pull this guy off. So this poor sap was terrified. So again, 
I don't know if it's a real story or not, but it's interesting. There are so many instances in paranormal experience where people experience, they see something different within the same experience. Even Betty and Barney Hill had some interesting differences in their abduction case while they had a very similar experience. But uh, so that's, I, I know that going off on these tangents, when I, uh, when I spoke at the Beast of Bray Road conference last uh, October, I, I was talking mainly about cryptids, but some of the stranger aspects, the high strangest aspects of cryptids. And every once in a while, I take one of these detours and I put the image up there would be a detour sign. And we go off on these crazy patterns and then we come back to the main drag. But that is what that's what's so fascinating about this stuff. You and I talked about early on that these things are all connected. And if you you don't have to imagine it, you don't have to force it. But if we listen to the experiences of the experiencer, they, it just all falls into place. Sir Wolf is asking about Indrid Cold oh, and, yes. and the role that Indrid Cold played in this. For people who may not know, who is Indrid Cold and the relevancy to the Mothman story? Indrid actually showed up uh, a couple days before that major sighting. And Indrid is more of a... Woodrow Derenberger is the man that said he contacted him initially, or I should say, Mr. Cold contacted him initially. Um, Woodrow Derenberger fits more the contact mold. You know, we have the abductees uh, where they're taken without any. I mean, they don't. Uh, they don't get. They don't have a choice. The classic contactees like George Adamski, who supposedly contacted the Venusian in the desert in California, and all these guys, including Woodrow Derenberger, it was more of a, uh, you know, we uh, we want the contact. We want to go with you. Uh, it was it happened on, uh, oh, it was uh, early November, earlier November before the, the first Mothman sighting. And he was driving on Route 77 near Parkersburg. He was a appliance salesman. He sees this craft. He's on the highway. I guess there's no cars around there at the moment, but he sees this craft. He describes it as kind of a, uh, if you could imagine the chimney of a kerosene lamp, where it's kind of uh, wide in the middle and the tapers at each end. This kind of a craft. At first, when he saw it coming up around him, he thought it was a car, but it wasn't. It came around. It cut him off. He pulled off to the side of the road. And this strange character with his hair slicked back, his arms crossed, <laughs> pardon me, in some kind of coveralls, uh, told that he, his name was Cold. He didn't didn't have a first name at that time. And he had this pointless conversation about, he asked him what the lights were up ahead, and, and uh, Derenberger said, well, it's a city. And he said, well, we call those gatherings. And it was a, if this guy was really a visitor from space, it was one of the most mundane, boring conversations you could possibly have. And then he said, I will, uh, I will see you again. He gets in his craft and he takes off. Supposedly, so there were other witnesses that saw this man and saw the craft there. Um, as the story unfolds with Derenberger, he gets, as with many of the contactees, well, there may have been an initial experience that was real or had some reality. He seemed to embellish later on. He wrote a book called Visitors from Langulos. And he seemed to embellish a lot of the, you know, supposedly he went to uh, the, the planet Langulos and uh, the whole trip only took an hour and a half. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's there's more to the story because before Woodrow Derenberger had a story and he went to the, 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 uh, the newspaper, he went to the police, it was uh, interviewed on TV and so forth. A few days before that, Mary Heyer had this man come to him wasn't wasn't come to her it wasn't uh, Derenberger and he told almost exactly the same story he and his buddy were traveling on route 77 this spaceship came down they talked to this guy didn't get a name of this entity and he uh, and that was that and he was going to come forward with it he was going to uh, uh, talk about it in the news uh, give the give the, the story to Mary Heyer and then later on he changed his mind. So he in, in, uh, is on the phone with Keel and Hire, and uh, 
And the guy says to Keel, he says, yeah, you know, that scientist fella said we should forget all about it. And Keel said, scientist fella? She says, yeah, he seemed like he knew he was talking about. And uh, <clears throat> so Keel said, well, how did this guy know? Because you didn't tell anybody else, right? He says, damned if I know. So somebody came and wanted to be quiet. So Keel forgot about it. You know, there's no, the guy's anonymous. It's not worth reporting. A few days later, Woodrow Derenberger tells the same story. And then um, several months later, there was a woman across the river in Gallopolis, Ohio. He calls her Mrs. Bryant in the Mothman Prophecies. She was leaving. She was a nurse, I believe. She was leaving the hospital or the doctor's office, whatever it was. And she remained anonymous. And she saw this craft come down in the parking lot it's late at night. These two men come out that sound very much like Indrid Cold and this other guy. And another pointless, mindless conversation. And she doesn't, you know, she's kind of paralyzed. She can't do anything about it. And they, they leave, they take off. The next day, she sees them in town, walking downtown in plain clothes. And one of them kind of nods at her like, oh, nice to see you again. This stuff gets, this stuff really gets out. You know, you go to the fringe and then you go a little further. Um, so, but she had all kinds of other things. She had her own little skinwalker ranch going on on her farm. There were animal mutilations, cattle mutilations right there on the farm. There were, her, her son was seeing these large boxcar-like craft of some kind silently move over the farm. Um, they were, they, she was having classic haunting phenomena, apparitions walking through her, her, uh, her house and then walking out the door, which had no porch and went out back. Um, they, they, you know, it was just one of these, and she was, uh, you know, she had gone to the police. They thought she was nuts. Uh, when she was talking to John Keel, that's when she asked him, she said, did that man see him again? Meaning, did Woodrow Derenberger see Andrew Cold again? And Keel said, yes, he says he did. And that's when she told him his her story about seeing these Andrew Cold-like people. So you have, it, it, this happens so much in the paranormal. There are some elements that seem like there's some reality, some physicality to them. Then there's other stuff that's just nonsense. And it's so hard to piece it all together and try to make sense of it. But yeah, the Indrid Cold thing, of course, they dramatize that to a degree in uh, the Mothman Prophecies film. Well, it also came into play as we're about to go to break here at the bottom of the hour with Alan Greenfield yes. and the, the secret cipher of the UFO knots. It made an appearance in the Hellier documentary series as well. Hendrick Cold, Mothman. Steve Ward is here breaking it all down. We're going to go with a little bit more Mothman, then switch over to Dogman. How come there's no dog women out there? We'll find out what's from Steve when we come back on Space Down Radio right after this. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot. All right, we're clear. <clears throat> Flying on by tonight, man. Yeah. <clears throat> it's so awesome. Love shows like this. And there are so many of these areas that uh, you can find in the literature. There's a uh, fascinating book that was written by F.W. Holliday, who was the uh, Loch Ness researcher that went through the uh, interesting evolution where he thought Nessie was a plesiosaur, then it was a some kind of an oversized mollusk, and then thought it was some kind of a paranormal entity. But he and Randall Pugh wrote a book called The Dubbed Enigma. Dubbed was a... Uh, county in uh, southwestern Wales, 1977. And boy, you talk about the three ring circus of the paranormal that was going on there. <clears throat> Just bizarre. Seven foot silver humanoids 
uh, little little guys with uh, curved eye, curved noses and slanted eyebrows coming out of the same egg shaped craft as the tall guys in boiler suits or whatever they were. Um, you know, effects on the animals, uh, orbs. Uh, uh, people would uh, there were a lot of connections with folklore. People that were in a proximity of these silver giants would develop a rash sometimes, sometimes a weird dermatological rash. Well, there was something they used to call elf burn that you would get if you were in close proximity with the little people. Um, it's just, uh, and then there was the uh, displaced uh, uh, cattle on, on, this, on the Broadmoor farm, no, the uh, Ripperston farm. And they, uh, <clears throat> they'd be all penned up and then they'd show up a half mile later at the, at the Broadmoor farm. And nobody knew how they got there. Uh, one day, uh, Billy Coombs, was, uh, he put 16 of the cows in a pen and turns around to go in the barn, turns on the milking machines, comes back, and the cows are all gone. Where are they? They're at the Ripperston farm, the Broadmoor farm. I'm mixing them up. And, you know, you talk, there was that incident on the Skinwalker Ranch where the bulls yes. you know, turned up in that little trailer. Um there was another, oh, uh, uh, Alan Godfrey. I interviewed him. He's a, a classic abductee. Uh, he was a police officer in Tom Ward in England. And he was called on in this, where they, these cows showed up in this gated community. And they couldn't figure out how the hell they got there. And this, okay. this, this one lady, this older lady that had called it, you know, called out, out on them. You know, uh, uh, Godfrey at first thought it was a hoax. And she told him, she said, I may be old, but I'm not crazy. And I know what I saw. And she had seen some kind of a strange light. It was after that that Godfrey had his abduction experience. And when he, he, he was recounting it under hypnosis, and at one point he says, there's a, there's a bloody dog in here inside this craft, a large black dog inside this spacecraft. And, uh, you know, shades of what? The black shuck? The black spectral dog that haunts the uh, the ruins and castles in England. I mean, this stuff is, uh, you know, if it's if it wasn't so fascinating, it would send you to the funny farm. I think that is amazing, amazing. And he's I, a was, super I credible guy. Sit, I could just sit here and listen to stories all day long, man, and just shut <laughs> up, just make it happen. <clears throat> All right, we have about one minute. Well, this is a lot of fun, Dave. I appreciate this. No, nah, this is so much fun, dude. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you. We're, we'll bring you back on again very soon. I, I love it. There's your, uh, let's see here, quickly insider question here. Why am I not allowed TMI? There's your answer. Yeah. Oh, I love it. John, I love it. Thank you, buddy. John Davies. Oh, you are incredible. You are incredible. Good morning to you, my friend. Got a good audience Just here. This guy here, Jonathan Davies, Steve. Yes. Very connected. I have very connected. An incre his connections are incredible. Thank you to Surf Jair and Smithy for the super chats tonight. Very much appreciate the love and support through the super chat. Really, uh, thank you so much. Thank you to all our new subscribers and everybody tuning in. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up, thumbs down. We're going to rock right now, guys. Second can have. We pass a halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot, reading Shirky Poo's Newswire, and checking out our swag as well. 
Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. We continue on tonight. Steve Ward is here. We're talking Mothman, Indrid Cold. And a little bit later on, we're going to get into Dogman. We got him for another hour here on the Mighty SOR. Let's do this, Steve. Indrid Cold, aliens getting involved with Mothman. I mean, this Indrid Cold, I mean, we have seen him pop up everywhere everywhere for a while and then he just disappeared what do you think happened to him oh boy um you know there was also uh in an old issue of fate magazine uh there was somebody that claimed that uh about a year later he showed up you know the you have to be careful of some of the you might want to call them johnny come lately reports you know we don't know if that's true or not i know that susan shepherd uh susan shepherd was a uh a, a regular at the Mothman Festival. She spoke often on Indrid Cold, great lady, another great person that we lost not too long ago. And uh, she was from Parkersburg. She ran some kind of a uh, uh, a tour group up there. Former guest she, on this show as well. Yes, great lady. Uh, she. It seems to me that one of her relatives claimed to have, have had an encounter with Indrid Cold, and that would be in one of her books, she also told me that now here some of some of Derenberger's stuff. Keel believed this too, that Derenberger made up a bunch of stuff. But it seems like there was some substance to the original contact. Um, you know, it's just so hard to say. But but that Susan Shepard told me that he would sometimes his family would be going out, and he would say, you know, you're you're going to see something. You're going to see a UFO or however he put it, when you're out today. And sure enough, they would see something unexplained in the sky. So, you know, another another uh, thing to, to put in the, the story that, uh, you know, gives it some credibility, I guess. But, uh, yeah, he hasn't, well, you know, when you get into the men in black phenomena, he actually kind of fits the, uh, the profile of some of them. Uh, there's, the, the men in black, by the way, uh, Akil used it as a kind of a generic term because all these characters, whatever the hell they were, didn't always dress up in dark suits and fedoras. Sometimes they would come as Air Force officers who weren't Air Force officers. They checked on it later on and there was nobody by the name of Major French or, or whatever it was. Uh, some really bizarre reports would come out of that, although some of the men in black phenomena just seemed to be, you know, government goons showing up harassing UFO witnesses, trying to collect their photographs. So another uh, wide, uh, complex subject where there's just not one in. That's one thing I can say that definitively in all of this stuff, there's not one answer to all these things, unfortunately. <laughs> and so that's why we're chasing our tails so much all the time. Well, I, I understand that, but I mean, Indrid Cold has seems to pop in and out at the at the most mysterious of times starting with the mothman and then like i said alan greenfield with the secret cipher of the ufo knots and i have a weird story about that and his publisher olaf phillips that happened between olaf and i earlier this year hmm. uh, right in january and it was freaky it was uh, it was very freaky it led to a very weird logo here that that came to me uh, on a phone call and hmm. it was, it was extremely odd. And we had numerous conversations with Alan about this, uh, this incident and yet in cold, not there, of course, I know nothing about the guy or if he's even real. Do you believe that he is a real entity, an alien? Um, I'm a little, uh, I, I don't, I'm going to say no, I, I don't think, uh, he was an alien. Let's, let's say that, let's say he did have some reality. Let's say there was a, some real experience going on there. If you look at the history of the contact movement from aliens, entities of all description, or even people to get messages from, from wherever, uh, Oftentimes, these guys are liars. You know, people have these conversations and they think they're the first one to get this revelation, whether it comes out of the clouds or a man from a spaceship. Um, you know, they, we, we've had uh, 
Uh, I mean, and, and this goes with the channeling too. Some of the channelers, uh, Ruth Montgomery, her guides told her that we were going to have these uh, these pole shifts in the 1990s. Didn't happen. Uh, so many of these predictions don't happen. Uh, so I'm always skeptical of any messages, even even if these are real experiences, even if they're a real physical entity stepping out of some kind of a craft. I'm always doubting. I tell people, don't believe it. Um, it's probably, you know, John Keel had, he had these great catchphrases. And one of them was the great phonograph in the sky. And what that meant was people would get these revelations, however they got them. And they think, oh, this is wonderful. I, I'm the first person to, uh, to, uh, to get this. And if you go back in history, nope. It's been repeated over and over again. You know, isolated people would get these things. You can find them in obscure volumes of forgotten lore, right? And uh, so I just caution people that the messages, the revelations, uh, while some of them may be legitimate, they may be lofty predictions or, or great knowledge, I just caution people to be very careful about uh, believing them. What do you believe in? I believe that there is a, uh, a very complex phenomena going on, that the, a, a large aspect of that is, is connected with human consciousness, that there, is a, there may be a co-creation to some degree. This is not the whole story, but when you look at John Keel, his ideas of ultra-terrestrials, transmogrifications of energy, the reflective factor the way these things sort of reflect back our belief systems. Um, uh, Carl Jung with his collective unconscious, um, the idea of tulpas. Uh, remember Alexandria David Neal, who wrote Magic and Mystery in Tibet, is supposed to have created a tulpa uh, when she was living with the Tibetans. They supposedly taught her how to create one of these things. And it didn't go very well. It, uh, she created this jolly little llama, not the uh, not the animal, but the but the sage, the seer. And she could only see this guy, and he was this fat, chubby little, happy entity. And over time, he became mischievous. His appearance changed, and then a little bit further along the line, he got very thin and lean and very nasty. And she claims in her book that she had to actually destroy this thing with her mind. Well, again, we don't know if that's true or not, but a lot of these, these things may simply be uh, thought forms. Uh, but that's not the only, you know, I was on that track for uh, a long time, very much influenced by Keel. And I still think, I still think Keel was a hundred years ahead of, ahead of everybody, but there also does seem to be a, you know, uh, uh, Albert Rosales uses the term in his books, the others amongst us. There does seem to be, in some cases, some other intelligence, some other entities. I, they, may be, they may be part of this planet. Uh, they may be ET. They may be coming from other realms, dimensions that we can't, can't access. So, I, you know, so there, does seem, there seems to be, and a lot of people don't like this, but both things seem to be going on. There seems to be some kind of an intelligence. There may be, you know, if there's one crashed saucer that puts it in the realm of the physical. I'm kind of skeptical of Roswell and many of the other claims, but uh, there still may very well be a real physicality to some of this. So then how do we, how do we reconcile both of them? I, I think that there is some element of human consciousness that creates these phantasms, these images, or help shape them. Um, I think that if there were no ETs, we would create them somehow, you know, as part of our uh, human consciousness and just the way the way we're wired. Um, you know, creating other gods, other other beings, or whatever. But what if there's also some other intelligence? I mean, a real physical intelligence that's interacting with us somehow. What if they're aware of this mechanism in human consciousness. And could, if that's so, and this is way out on a limb, but could they perhaps utilize that and exploit it? Perhaps they could, using technology or, or focus of will, 
create their own images to mislead us, to misguide us, to make us see whatever they want. Perhaps both major things are going on. The bottom line is, Dave, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Okay, well, let me let me ask you this then. Do you believe that Dogman exists? Are you yes. someone who... Okay, so why do you believe Dogman exists? Because, uh, and, you know, Keel again, I, I, you know, I can barely choke out a few sentences without talking about John Keel. But he talked about these kinds of cryptids that they seem to, uh, it's almost like they come out of nowhere, but they act like real animals. I mean, they'll, they, they, uh, will eat roadkill, they will kill other animals and leave footprints and hair samples, and then they seem to sort of dissipate. Um, recently, uh, after I, I, I spoke at the Dogman, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Beast of Bray Road conference this past October, and that Saturday night, we went over to Lee Hample's farm. Now, let me, let me just backtrack a little bit. Uh, Linda Godfrey, with the Beast of Bray Road, she's the one that kind of introduced us to the the Dogman phenomena. It's been going on forever, but it seems to me that people were that were seeing these things were pretty quiet about it. Um, it's almost like it was maybe sort of legitimate. I'm not so crazy to see a Bigfoot, but man, an upright canid, about six foot tall, with with red with yellow eyes and in a in a mean countenance. You know, let's stay away from that. But we went to, uh, now Lee Hample, well, I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, I'm jumping all over. Linda Godfrey wrote The Beast of Bray Road. She uh, was working for The Week, a uh, little newspaper in Elkhorn, Wisconsin. She was a cartoonist and wrote a little, I wrote this column. And she ran into these stories about people seeing these dog-like things on Bray Road. Sometimes they'd see it on all fours and they think it's some big mangy dog and then it would stand upright. And uh, one person saw one of these things on its knees eating roadkill. So she went to the local police and the sheriff there actually had a file that said werewolf because he'd been getting these reports for some time. Very interesting that right in the first part of the book, The Beast of Bray Road, she talks about how people uh, that were having these experiences were also would have other paranormal experiences just like the Mothman, just like so many other people that are connected in this miasma of, uh, of strangeness. And uh, so she's written several books on this and it's just grown. Well, in a subsequent book called The Monsters Among Us, she talked about Lee Hample, and, but using a different name. And she was talking about these strange mists he was seeing on his farm. And uh, so we went there that night and he showed us two hours of photographs that he had taken on these game cameras. He, When he first went there, he uh, bought the farm in about 2007, started farming it in 2011. And a few years after, it, some of the locals had told him, he said, you know, there's a werewolf on your land. And he thought, this guy was a mathematician for 45 years in Illinois, a man of science. What do you mean there's a werewolf on my property? But he would talk to other people, credible people in the area that had seen this thing. And then he saw it. He's even had missing time on his property. Um, so we saw, we sat, you know, we heard his stories. Uh, these strange mists would show up. And, and sometimes they would be captured by the camera, but you couldn't see him with your naked eye. There was a photograph of him triggering the camera, apparently, out in broad daylight. And he's surrounded by this mist but he didn't see anything. There would be deer carcasses out on his property. And you can tell by the timestamp on the photographs, how long this takes. There would be a mist that would show up. And then sometime later, the carcass would be gone. No drag marks, no footprints. But speaking of footprints, he started seeing these dog-like footprints. Um, five toes. That doesn't make any sense. A pad and a heel. In the snow, sometimes they would start in the middle of nowhere. And sometimes he'd see them stop in the middle of nowhere. His, he told his brother Fred at first about this. And Fred suggested that they must have parachuted in, uh, tongue in cheek, obviously. Now, uh, Fred is, is convinced, as Lee is, 
that there's something bizarre going on on the property. It's so hard to convey the photographs, what I saw there, but there are objects in the sky. There's one that looks like a like metallic turtle shell, and the thing zips in. These are all stills, but you can tell by the timestamp that this thing just whipped around a tree in no time. <laughs> there was one bizarre, you know, you can't make sense of some of these things. There's one photograph in the daylight where it's sort of a, like a, a rope or a ribbon or something suspended in the air. It's black. It makes two, two hills, two humps. And then Lee moves the camera over, the, I mean, the, the image over. So you see something that's like, like a machine, like a boxy machine with a couple of circles on it or wheels or something that's suspended in the air. Uh, it would strange light phenomena where the beams are coming down at night and then they stop in the middle of nowhere. You can't freeze frame light going at 186,000 miles a second. He uh, would, was doing experiments with roadkill. He had this uh, raccoon out there. And then one time uh, it was it was in the tall grass and there was nothing there that would disturb the grass. So whatever affected it had to actually lean over like a man. But he saw it had a perfect incision down its body and the entrails were hanging out pretty gross but and then it, and then later on it disappeared he would leave uh, other game out and something would take it sometimes there was a miss sometimes not but the cameras wouldn't function or whatever it was was cloaked there's a couple pictures where you can see kind of an outline of something that could have been the dog man. Now he's seen this thing twice and he's documented the footprints. Um, let me digress for just a moment. In Monsters Among Us, Linda Godfrey talks about a sighting in the 90s or a Highway 81, uh, Pennsylvania. He, this guy is driving along at night and the road goes into a, uh, where it would have been a hill. And uh, on the one side is a forest and he sees this light moving along the forest. And he thinks it's some, you know, careless guy on maybe an ATV. And he sees it's going to intersect with the road. And he's concerned that this guy is going so fast, he's going to go off this little ledge and then come down to the road. Well, as he sees, as he gets closer and sees the light come down, it morphs into an upright canid and takes off. There's many cases in the literature where people see some kind of a light or orb, and it seems to transmute into some kind of a creature. So is it is it really actually transforming, or is that the window that it comes through wherever else it, it you know comes from? Uh, he got hair samples of this thing, but and I uh, forgive me, I can't remember what the uh, what the core inside the uh, the hair sample is, but I forget what it's called, but it's not there. It's like it's 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 like it's not a complete animal or something like that. And I wonder if Keel was right when he talked about how these things seem to come into existence sometimes, act like real animals. But but here's okay. Here's the uh, here's the paradox. These things are real. They leave footprints. People see them. They eat roadkill. They affect their environment but it's so hard to capture them on camera. That suggests there's just some intelligence involved, but they don't seem to be the intelligence. They just seem to act like blind animals, you know, just not blind animals, but you know what I mean? Animals uh, governed by instinct. So, so here's, here's the, again, we're, we're filled with paradoxes. It's real, it affects the environment, but it just, there's so much of it that doesn't make any sense. The analogy I give usually is that we, uh, it's like we have, if we had a thousand piece puzzle and we could look at it, we might, we might be able to say, oh, okay, now that makes sense. But we've only got about 12 pieces of it and they're scattered all over the place. So we have no idea how to put them together. We just don't have any idea at this point what the big picture is. But we have made progress from the 60s where UFOs were just ETs, Bigfoot lived in the Northwest as some kind of a big monkey and ghosts were ghosts and the paranormal had nothing to do with any of that. Apparently 
Charles Fort was right. Apparently, John Keel was right. This dog man, we first hear about it publicly at the Beast of Bray Road. Then we start hearing about it popping up in Michigan, Indiana, Ohio. And now, 2021, near the end, we see it everywhere from British Columbia, where I am, down to sightings on the East Coast in New York and South, and right across the nations and the continent. Do you think this creature is spreading out or people are recognizing maybe <coughs> what they thought was a bear or a wolf or or a, a Bigfoot? I, they're I, starting I, to recognize that this is a different creature. Yeah, I think there's, there's got to be an element. People would, would see this thing in the woods and, you know, very hard to process. But, uh, you know, there's a, uh, what is it, Dog Man Encounters Radio, Vic Kundu. He has people on that uh, a lot of people saw this thing years ago, but they just kept quiet about it for, you know, obvious reasons. So perhaps that's another element. Perhaps many people have seen this actually all over the world. Uh, that may be what our werewolf legends come from, you know, um, but uh, perhaps it was just has been one of those things that's just too, too crazy and people haven't. Now, there are places they can talk about it. They know other people have seen them. But, you know, if if this is a phenomena that is perhaps tied somewhat to human consciousness and, and, and our belief systems, uh, perhaps you know more of them are are manifesting or or whatever. You know, it's it's impossible to say because we, we can't step back and be objective enough. We can't be all knowing to know exactly what's what's been going on. But it is interesting that uh, now this is a phenomena. They're they're just as uh, as prevalent as as Bigfoots really. But here's here's something, Dave. Um, why is it? I mean, um, you know, we talk about the Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, not too much in the way of Bigfoots out that way, although I guess there have been. But a, a, a phantom menagerie of all kinds of creatures. We had the Bradshaw Ranch in uh, near Sedona. That was another Skinwalker Ranch, uh, Bigfoot, UFOs, time loss, etc. Why is it, I wonder, that the Dogman creature seems to be prevalent along with all this other stuff? Uh, missing time, strange craft, strange mechanical devices, um, and Bigfoot. I mean, you know, Bigfoot is prevalent in southern Wisconsin, I guess, but it right. seems like the different areas have at least some specific characteristic. The Mothman isn't, uh, you know, isn't something that pops up in a lot of these high strangers areas. All right, Steve, I'm going to get you to hold on. We got you for another half an hour here on Spaced Out Radio to kick off hour number three. Then at the bottom of hour number three, it's Dave 101 time. UFO topic tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers. This is John Resig. There we go. We're clear. <coughs> <clears throat> I swallowed my water the wrong way. Oh, you know when you get that that cough, yeah. that dry cough afterwards. <clears throat> mm. So when we get to the break at the bottom of the hour, just stick through until we get to the break, and then I will uh, I will bring you on properly there, or okay. say good night to you properly. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Oh, let's go here. Thank you so much again for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. That was awesome, man. <clears throat> Let's get over to here. Sometimes I think my job is done during the night, and then I realize that <clears throat> I got to get everything set up for the after show as well. <laughs> so 
So like this. Clap here. We're almost there. <coughs> Felipe, how you doing, man? I'm glad you were here to do this for us. <clears throat> so what do you do when you're not chasing monsters, Steve? Well, I'm a... Uh... A, a, allegedly a retired man of leisure. <laughs> um, I uh, was going to be moving in the not too distant future. So I'm <sighs> gathering up a lot of books and stuff that I don't expect to be using right away. And there's a lot, a lot to get, get together in the house. Uh, but I, I do, uh, I do a show, a uh, podcast called the high strangest factor. And uh, so I, and uh, <clears throat> And I, I do uh, some uh, great uh, networking with some good friends in the uh, in the field, and we Skype a lot. Occasionally get together, and um, it's nice that uh, lately uh, people have been able to get together again and go to some yes. of these conferences. So, although they canceled the Mothman conference again this last year, so that's two years, and that's two years too many. Yeah. Jonathan wants to know, uh, do you know about Ripper, Ripperstone Farm? Uh, yes. That was in, in Dublin, Wales. Uh, that, that's the, at least I know about it during the, uh, pretty much around 1977. And there were several books. There was the Dublin Enigma. Um, there's a, at least three other books, maybe four, that cover the, the some of the bizarre happenings there. But, uh, yeah, that was... Uh, um fascinating stuff and it's also covered in uh i don't know if you're familiar with uh haunted skies that series put together uh, uh about britain not always britain but uh there, there's phenomenal books uh can't remember the name of the guy that uh puts them together but he uh, uh that covers some aspects of that in a, in a lot of detail uh and in fact randall Pugh be began to believe that i think he began to believe that the, this was actually demonic and not uh not really et or anything like that he and uh, holiday made a lot of connections between what was going on in, in folklore but uh well well pew doesn't mention it in the W enigma uh he did begin to believe that uh they were uh, dealing with dark forces wow we've got just over one minute to go here okay Good morning, Joey Hayes from the UK. <clears throat> Jeez, a lot of people in the UK getting up early this morning for our chat room. 203 watching right now. Oh, good deal. Uh, my my co-host and my producer for my show, uh, Andy Mercer, is a Brit. And uh, so we have to deal with the five hours difference sometimes. Yeah. Uh, can we have somebody, we've had, we had somebody on from the... Uh, in Pacific time, one time. So, uh, when do you broadcast? Uh, it's uh, it, it every every other Tuesday the podcast comes out. Right. So, I, of course, I make the show whenever, whenever I can, and then uh, <coughs> Paranormal UK Radio Network. Right on. Okay, we got 17 seconds. Thank you to Ben, Surf Jair, and Smithy for the super chats tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you to everybody who's hit that subscribe button and rang that bell. And of course, here we go. Get your horns up. Hour three, beginning now, Mr. B.
Would you like to connect with us? And SOR. Third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth, hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. What do you got for us, Clam? Tanicles. Tanicles is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clown, clam, not the clown, the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot, read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire, check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio, Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show, and now on TikTok at Spaced Out Radio. For the final time tonight, Steve Ward is here. He's chasing down Mothman, chasing down Dogman, UFOs. He's tripping on legends based out of the beautiful state of Michigan. And we got him until the bottom of the hour talking Dogman. You know, Steve, one thing about this, this creature, people always say that it seems to get telepathic with them, that if they raise some sort of weaponry to this animal, creature, monster, whatever we want to call it, that they seem to get this telepathic message that is like, yeah, that's not a good idea. I'd lower your rifle. Have you ran into any cases like that? Um, what I've heard is that people uh, feel a, a strong sense of of evil coming from them, a, a, something really sinister, whereas uh, I guess we could say that's a distinction between uh, uh, some Bigfoot encounters. While people get pretty freaked out by the the big, hairy bipeds, that they might encounter in the woods. The dog man seems to have a, a uh, malevolence to him. Um, so uh, now let me, uh, I just found out uh, today that, uh, well, Lee, Lee Hample again uh, with his farm right near Bray road. He told us that uh, uh, there was somebody out there. I didn't just tell the story today. Um, somebody was uh a group was out there with permission. They were going to spend the night and see what they could see. And at 1030, they came and knocked on his door. And uh, he, uh, they said, we, we got to leave. We were told to leave. And he said, what do you mean? I, I own the property. You can stay all night. And he said, no, we were told to leave. And apparently, they had some kind of a ghost box or something like that. And that's the message they got. So they got the hell out of there. Somebody else wrote me recently that heard the shows I've been doing on on the Bray Road, that they were out there till about three in the morning one night, but the fog got so thick and 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 so forth that he the way he put it was it, it pushed them out. So the these mists or whatever don't they don't seem to be normal atmospheric conditions, and you know with with the with the uh, the shadow of uh, I'm sure you're you're familiar with uh, David Politis. And is yes. missing four one one books. Um, you know, I, <coughs> I I don't know. I just think that if if the if I saw a mist a, a kick up like that, I might get the hell out of there too. Who was it? Uh, oh, uh, Elias Owen, who wrote the book Welsh Folklore. He talks about the little people, the fairies, and how uh, wayfarers on the road were very concerned about uh, traveling at night and encountering these mists because he said the little people would take them up into the air and deposit them someplace, you know, for a little bit of mischief and, and make, and let them find their way home. Now that just sounds like an abduction you know, situation where uh, people are walking along the road, they encounter some kind of force and they lose the time and they're deposited somewhere else. So I don't know. I don't know that I would stick around if things got a little bit too misty either. Um, we really don't know what we're dealing with. You know, there was a that great, uh, in uh, the book on hunters by uh, David Politis, 
um, he has that encounter toward the end. Um, uh, Jan Maccabee, yes. she was a hunter, bow hunter. She's in her blind and she sees something jumping around in the tree. And it's it's got that uh, sort of a, some people call it the shimmer or the predator effect or the quicksilver curtain is what uh, one of the researchers calls it, uh, Thomas Powell. And uh, when she, she took photographs with her phone, her husband, Bruce Maccabee, who is a photography expert and worked for the Navy in, in, in such a capacity, when he developed the photograph, you can, if you look at it, it's reproduced. There's these black hairs that seem to be coming out of the side of the shimmer. At the same time, uh, she didn't know it at the time, but there was, she got a text that she read later. Her nephew, which was about a half mile away, he was at band practice or something, I think, at the local high school. They saw some kind of a light or craft hovering over the, the uh, football field. At the same time, all this stuff was going on with Jan. So, and I know that she has mentioned that they've had other stuff that they've captured in, in trap cameras on her property. So, um, you know, you, you I don't know. A, a lot of people have tried to uh, spend the night on Lee Hample's farm, and they don't get very far. I know that if there's, there's a, a, a YouTube video, Bucks County Paranormal Investigates. Now, I met these guys. Dominic and uh, Eric and Ellen, they, they did an investigation and the uh, the YouTube video runs about a half hour. The, they didn't stay out there too long. They got, you can hear them. They got these howls uh, back and forth on the property. I don't know if it's, it's a dog man or not, but they said they saw eye shine about six feet off the ground. Now, unless these uh, guys are on stilts or something like that, <laughs> or you've got some kind of a, uh, you know, crazy, you uh, uh, expensive. Uh, they, they were, uh, Dominic, by the way, uh, Dominic uh, uh, Settel is a sensitive. And when he goes, he doesn't normally do the cryptid thing, but he, uh, he does pick up vibes in different places. And I asked him, I said, Dominic, what did you feel like when, uh, when, you, uh, when you were out there that night? And he said, I felt like I was in a diving suit in a shark cage and I was holding the bait. They, they went, the next week they went to the Pine Barrens to look for Bigfoot because there are Bigfoot reports out there. They're with a couple of uh, seasoned researchers. They got some crazy howls, you know, real or not, I don't know. But uh, Dominic remarked how, <laughs> how, how, how more frightening and more unnerving it was to be on Lee Hample's farm in proximity of the dog man perhaps than being out there in the deep dark pine barrens looking for bigfoot jonathan in the uk is asking do you think dogman bilocates through time have you heard that and and are long lifers with instant healing uh i haven't heard about the healing although there's uh there are a lot of healings associated with ufo phenomena um uh, uh what's his name uh, preston I, I can't think of his full name right now Preston Dennett. Preston Bennett. Uh, 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 no, no. Uh, yeah. Preston yeah. Dennett. Preston Dennett. He's written, uh, he wrote a book on, on 300 healings uh, of people that had close proximity with UFOs. There's this, there's the, uh, the sort of the good and the evil, the positive and the negative uh, poles in a lot of UFO phenomena. So I've heard about it there. I've not heard about that associated with Dogman, but I have heard about it associated with Bigfoot. Uh, strangely enough, um, I don't know about going through time. If if some of these other reports of you know seeing the orb morphing into a dog man, they are either coming into existence or coming from somewhere else and have existed, you know, through that whole sequence. But uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm very uh, very hesitant to get very no pun intended dogmatic on these things because we, we just don't know we, we try and gather all the information we we can listen to the witnesses and then look at the look at the patterns that exist and uh, hopefully we can get some uh, uh, you know some real information uh, out of all of it 
have you ever heard of Dogman and Sasquatch brawling for territory? Because I'm going to tell you right now, that is a pay-per-view event I want to see. <laughs> it is. Well, I, I haven't, but um, I uh, it certainly, it would kind of make sense. I mean, if, if both these things are real and people are experiencing them, um, you know, I, as far as I know, uh, the people in that, that particular area haven't had any Bigfoot reports, but that doesn't mean they haven't. Um, Dogman seems to be prevalent there. And there are, are some places where you don't seem to hear about the Dogman, but um, you know, there's so much we really don't know. At least that I don't know. Okay, so no, and I and I understand that. But have have you ever heard of of territorial markings or or I know nobody see the fight, but I would assume two giant alpha type creatures like that would be very very protective of their area and wouldn't like other predators coming in. I think that's a logical assumption. Um, but we just don't know. We just don't know what their normal stopping grounds are, you know, or, or where they might overlap, which is so much we don't know. Um, they they seem, you know, my, my impression was that when the Bucks County team went out there and when other people have gone out there, it's almost like the dogmen are sentinels. You know, you get too close and they start howling back and forth at each other or they may even show themselves it's almost like maybe i don't know maybe perhaps they're used by whatever intelligence is there to as guardians um there are there are beliefs that the uh that the dogmen were uh, guardians of some of the mounds you know the the effigy mounds and in, in fact uh linda godfrey in uh, her second book, Hunting the American Werewolf, quite by accident, she uh, she took a book. Uh, I think I've got it here. It's on Wisconsin, Indian Indian mounds of Wisconsin, and it shows a map of southern Wisconsin and the various effigy mounds. And she noticed that clusters of dogman reports were almost perfectly coinciding with certain types of mounds, namely the water spirit mounds and the panther mounds. Now the panther mounds are, if you look at them, they're very simple. They're like if you could, would draw the outline of a panther and with the small tail and the ears and so forth and the legs. The water spirit mounds seem to be, to me, physically smaller, but the thing that distinguishes them is sort of a long pointed tail. But for some reason, perhaps total coincidence, uh, these, these, these sightings, these clusters of sightings seem to overlap in those areas. So that brings up another question. John Keel talked about the ancient mounds and the strange lights in the sky. And he asked the question, what came first? Did, were the lights there manifesting? And did the ancients build the mounds in a, to acknowledge them? Or did they build the mounds and did the, the residue of their consciousness or their, their worship create the lights? Hmm. Creating light, that almost sounds spiritual. So could you could you draw the line then to maybe this being a hellhound or something along those lines? Well, um there there may be, there may have been attacks from uh, uh, you know by uh, these things on humans, but it seems more like uh these creatures, including Bigfoot. Uh, are just there to scare the hell out of you. Now, perhaps some people have encountered them and been dinner and, you know, we, there was nobody there to witness it. And if they did find a body, they might just think it's some other natural predator. So I, I don't know, but it does seem like uh, as scary as they are, uh, they don't seem to be attacking people. They certainly could. I mean, if they're if if these things if these reports are real, if they're if these people in this area are seeing something physical, and it does seem like they are, it would be uh, it would seem like. I mean, look, if there were if there were actually wolves there, in that area, in the same number, 
I think perhaps people would be attacked sometimes, but they people don't seem to be, with my limited knowledge about it, they don't seem to be attacked by these things. Then why the fear? Why do we always feel like these things are ready to kill us and rip us apart? Butch Witkowski says the same thing about these bipedal canines that are in the Pennsylvania area, central Pennsylvania. Well, there does it does seem to be when uh, uh, the uh, Eric, Dominic, and Ellen, when they when they were out there, they they were pretty freaked out, and uh, uh, you know, well, uh, you know, Dominic was picking up negative vibes. Uh, Eric doesn't. He said he doesn't normally get unnerved at these places. I mean, he's been in some creepy places, but it really got to him, and Ellen felt the same way. So, you know, we, we don't know, is it, is it the one's imagination running away with them or is there something, well, you know, we talk about, uh, uh, some of the researchers talk about infrasound and Bigfoot and they can kind of somehow influence people uh, through some kind of a mental blast or contact, I, I don't know. But uh, these things could just be scary enough by themselves, but there may, there may be something there that is, there's something maybe perhaps a little more there where they exude something like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that I will get a chance to spend the night or at least part of the night on Lee Hample's farm. You know, I've always wanted to get access to one of these places, which we call high strangeness areas, window areas, portals, um, vortexes, whatever, whatever term you want. Uh, it's almost like on that farm is a laboratory where people can go and actually experience the phenomena or at least observe it, uh, you know, after it's been photographed. We have about five and a half minutes left with you tonight. You know, when it comes to all these cryptids and, and everything, we've talked Dogman and Mothman mainly tonight, you know, but do you have a favorite encounter that you have experienced that you just cannot put your finger on them? What happened? I've only had one weird experience, and that was uh, one night. I uh, I was with some friends, and they they I was in Pen, uh, Point Pleasant. They went home, and I thought, well, I want to go into the TNT area alone at night. And you know, it's it's no big deal to the locals. They they can camp out there, and uh, at least they used to be able to as a campground on fish and so forth. But I thought, you know, with, with the, the creepy legends and all the history of this area. I just wanted to see if I could do it. So I went down Potter's Creek Road. Potter's Creek has the, the line of igloo roads. And I went to this seventh one, which we normally go to. And some of those igloos have been featured on different shows where they go in there with their uh, recorders and so forth. And I went down there. It was in, in uh, it was late in May. And there was all kinds of nightlife out there. I mean, the, 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 the bugs and the, and the frogs was almost deafening. So I went, went down there and I went, had my flashlight and my recorder and I went down to one of the igloos and uh, that was about it. So I went, I'm driving back and I, you know, I, I didn't, I should have written down and paid better attention to what was happening. Although I've heard other people say when weird stuff happens, sometimes they don't react properly. So I'm driving back down Route 62 and I experienced a couple of flashes of light, like a strobe, like a flash and a flash. And I can't figure out where it came from. And uh, it was in a real dark area. Um, so I went back to my motel, which was across the river in Gallipolis. And I opened the door and I look at the clock. And I, I think, well, you know, I th I, in, in thinking back, I might have lost some time. I don't know. But that's not the weird part. I opened the door. The TV set turned on by itself and started flipping through channels continuously. And I thought, holy expletive this doesn't happen to me this happens to other people so i did what any uh, uh rugged paranormal investigator would do i unplugged the tv set and went to bed <laughs> so now there's postscript to this um a year later i'm in the same motel next room over and uh, uh, those two buddies that I was there with that that night that went home early we're all crammed in there saving some money, right? 
and we're talking, and all of a sudden the TV set turns on by itself. Now, these in both cases, it's one of these older TV sets, not one of the big fancy uh, you know, digital ones or whatever. And that was it. Next day, one of the guys and I went into the back into the room to collect something. TV set turned on by itself and then flipped through a couple channels. So we took the remote and we went through walls and tried to see if maybe it was a stray signal. I don't know. A few years later, it was a Mothman festival. The next room over, which is in a corner and a bit bigger, there were two couples, two uh, uh, friends of ours that were staying there. They had one of the big uh, fancy screen TVs in there. So they're having trouble with the sound. They, the sound keeps getting lower and lower, and they start to crank it up more and more. Then all of a sudden it starts blasting. Then they start to have to turn it down again and go through the whole thing. And then all of a sudden there's a can of something that was sitting on one of the uh, tables, and it flies off by itself. So <laughs> my theory is perhaps, perhaps, you know, the TNT area was, in fact, uh, an Indian burial ground, you know, years ago, there were all kinds of battles out there. Perhaps I brought back something from the TNT area. If I did, fortunately, it's still there flipping channels and it didn't come home with me. But that night when that TV set went on by itself and flipped through channels, I, you know, I just wasn't prepared and I haven't really had anything since. My friend, we've got one minute to go here with you tonight, Steve Cook. Thank you, or Steve Ward. Thank you so much for coming on Spaced Out Radio. What a pleasure to have you here with us. Do us a favor. Let everybody know where they can find your research. Uh, uh, I'm on Facebook. If you type in Steve Ward and Battle Creek, you can probably find me. I do a podcast on Paranormal UK Radio called The High Strangeness Factor. You can also hear me as a correspondent on Mac Maloney's Military X Files. Uh, on the same on, on several different platforms and uh, that's on every week my show is on every other week and uh, i've seen some really nice comments from the audience uh, tonight which i really appreciate you, well you won them over you won them over big time and thank you so much for coming on spaced out radio steve you're you're a plethora of information and i don't throw the word plethora around for just anybody <laughs> my friend that's an important <laughs> word here I appreciate it, uh, Dave, so much. It's been a really, really great, uh, great show. Thank you. We are definitely going to do it again, Steve Ward, everybody. And coming up next on Spaced Out Radio, oh, yeah, it's Dave 101. It returns this week after the audio issues last week. And we're going to get into UFOs. Is the military-industrial complex... Trying to slap around electric elected officials. You'll hear it from me when we get back on Spaced Out Radio right after this. So stay tuned. Mighty SOR continues. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron. Great Bumble. show, buddy. Thanks, Dave. Very much. That was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. I'll look forward to the next time. Me too, my friend. Me too. You take it'll be it'll be probably spring. Okay. Spring. Yeah. That'll be cool. Should be another Dogman uh, conference by then, and perhaps I'll be able to brave Lee Hample's farm and and have a report. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. All right. Good night. Good night. Okay, everybody, I'm just going to run and uh, grab some uh, water here quickly. So just uh, bear with me and uh, be right back.
right, sorry about that. <clears throat> that was a good show. Oh, don't everybody leave now? We've lost like 10 people. Guest is gone. We're out of here. No. Just had to pee. Grab it and fill up my water. <clears throat> Prepare for day 101, peoples. And if you're going to turn that down. Felipe, if you want to stay in touch with a lot of the members, go to our Facebook group, Spaced Out Radio. There's a lot of people talking in there. Hey, there's the lovely and talented Nicole Sakic. She's not just a cook, people. Not just a cook. That is true. Three-year anniversary that Nicole made her debut on Spaced Out Radio. We've been stuck with her like a fungus ever since. Testing, one, two, good. Hi, gorgeous Jenster. Hey, Jen, on Instagram, can you send me your phone number privately to my, my Instagram account? I wanted to talk to you about your design stuff. Just get some ideas. That would be cool. <clears throat> Thank you to Ben from UFO Garage, Surf Jair, and Smithy. Make sure you guys are all following the following shows that we follow here as well, whether it's UFO Garage, Paranormal Chop Shop, the Chad Smith Show, Nicole Sackett's channel, and, of course, Thomas Fessler as well. Uh, that would be absolutely wonderful if you could. And... Uh, they're great shows. We support them. We love them. So here we go, everyone. We rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Read up on Shirky Poo's Newswire. Check out our swag as well. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's time once again for Dave 101. It's time for Dave 101. Ladies and gentlemen of ufology, if whether you're studying it, researching it, and experiencing it, or just have a curious interest, it is time for you and the rest of us to start looking at the mainstream media and holding them accountable for what they are not showing these days. Over the last two weeks, we have seen the military take on the elected in the United States. Now. 
We know the United States military spends a couple trillion dollars a year on whatever it is they want to buy, whatever new toys they want to test out or future technologies, all for the sake of defense. Now, this is including UFOs. Just about, oh, 10 days ago, out of the Pentagon came this report that basically stated, we'll put it in layman's terms, that they are creating a new group, getting rid of the UAP task force, and creating the AOI MSG. Now, sure, that sounds like a spice that you would put on food, but no, 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 no. has everything to do with UFOs. And in that report, the military basically said, we're going to cover what's happening in airspace. We are going to investigate these sightings, these encounters, these close encounters, try and figure out what these craft are. So Senator Gillibrand and everybody else who is worrying about this in the U.S. Senate or the Congress, you don't need to worry about it. We got you covered. But don't worry, elected officials. We're not going to give you any information whatsoever. Whatsoever. Now, elected officials, like Senator Gillibrand and now Congressman Tim Burchett, are speaking up against the military, saying, whoa, 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 people. We're the ones who are giving you the taxpayer dollars. We are the ones who are asking for some accountability on this subject. We, as the American people, have a right to know about what is going on in our airways, in our skies. Are we safe? Are we allowed to feel that we are not in trouble or in any sort of danger. Because, you know, the threat narrative plays well with any time the U.S. military wants money. In my opinion, this is the first time that we are actually seeing publicly a tete-a-tete between the military-industrial complex and elected officials, by the people, for the people. And it's all over UFOs. The most recent one to step into this foray is Tim Burchett. Now, for people who were listening earlier this fall to the Big Phone Home 2, put on by Lou Jimenez and his UCR group, the Unidentified Celebrity Review, on YouTube, you would know that Congressman Burchett actually called in and said he wants to know what's going on, that we have the right to know what's going on. We have a need to know what's going on. Well, Congressman Burchett has literally dropped the gloves, using a hockey term, because I am Canadian after all, on this entire subject. Let me quote here for a second. The Tennessee congressman doesn't want this new agency by the Pentagon to start up. He's not happy about it because it means less transparency. In Burchett's eyes, the Pentagon is only going to keep asking for more and more funding from Congress without giving up the goods on what they know about UFOs, and the House members think this is going down a road that is just plain foolish. It's true. It's totally true. This is why we see even people like Luis Elizondo and Chris Mellon being called out by the Pentagon, basically telling them, shut up, guys. Your opinion doesn't matter. So what did they do? They took to Twitter. UFO Twitter, and publicly to get the message out saying, hey, call your Congress people, call your senators, let's get this going. Because there is a war on the UFO front. It just doesn't involve aliens just yet. Now, the interesting part about this, because I am a media guy too, is 
The mainstream media really hasn't picked this up. Some have. Papers like The Hill, Politico, even TMZ. But where is this on the front page headlines of every major newspaper in the United States? You literally have the United States military and the Pentagon telling elected officials you do not have a right to know about UAP and what we find out about it. Now, I don't know about any other journalists out there, but it has my spidey senses kind of tingling a little bit, saying, there's a story here, and a major story. The military-industrial complex, ever since President Eisenhower warned the American public about it back in the 1950s, has literally been in control of everything that happens. The United States government spends more than the next 28 countries on military and defense annually, including Russia in that list. And when you look at what they have accomplished with technology, it's phenomenal. Going back to the days of the SR-71 and U-2, followed up by the F-117 stealth fighter, the B-2 bomber, the B-1 bomber, the F-22, the F-35, some will call the latter not very successful and extremely expensive, but they keep pushing technology forward. This is why the military-industrial complex does not want to give up its secrets, and the military knows that the media is not going to have any stories on this. They're not going to press the stories, even though every American right now should be outraged that they are telling the public, you do not have a right to know. They are telling the U.S. elected officials, we don't care what you think or what you may vote on. You're not getting any information. Dangerous, isn't it, when you think about it that way? If this subject wasn't about UFOs, it would be top priority for every media outlet out there. But, but because it is UFOs, and this subject has been a barren wasteland for decades for the media, they have zero interest in covering it, for the most part. This story needs to come out, whatever way possible. And I will be the first one to say that I was not a fan of any sort of narrative that we saw since the beginning of the To the Stars Academy. And Lord knows we could talk ad nauseum about that. But this new wave of information that is being blocked by the Pentagon is incredulous. And if you're American, you should be outraged. You should be calling your senators, writing them emails. You should be calling your Congress people. Because the military in the U.S. has just given every civilian, including electric elected officials, the middle finger. We don't know what UFOs are. We could only assume. We don't know what the United States government truly knows about this. Because people like Luis Elizondo and others, they are so embedded in their non-disclosure agreements that we'll never know the truth. But the stories are out there. The information is out there, and probably the crash retrievals and the alien bodies are out there. We can no longer deny this, even though the U.S. military wants us to. We need to know the story. We're big boys and girls now. We, we can handle it, so we think. But just like Jack Nicholson, they are screaming and berating, you can't handle the truth, even though we want the truth. Doesn't that make you think that the military has their own UFO Pandora's box that they don't want opened? Maybe they have 
worked with aliens at Area 51 or Wright-Patterson Air Force Base or Dugway or Dulcie. Maybe Bob Lazar's story is true. Maybe David Adair's story is true. Maybe Eisenhower meeting with aliens in the early 50s is true. What else are they hiding? How many crash retrievals do they have from around the world, not just on U.S. soil? How about crash retrievals from Canada, Mexico? There's word that there could possibly be one that happened in Russia from a long time ago when it was the Cold War. What about their astronauts? People keep making fun of us who believe in this topic as tinfoilers. We now know where that story is coming from. It's coming from the military. It is coming from the Pentagon. And because the media doesn't want this story, it's coming from them as well. And the military and the Pentagon and the alphabet agencies, they are playing each and every one of us like fools because they know, they know the answer. They know what it's all about. And yet, they're going to keep teasing us, giving us little tidbits of cheese when we're hungry, less than can feed a rat. Because we are the rats to them. And they do not want us to be feeding off of their information. They want this back under the rug where they feel it belongs. Because when it's back under the rug, nobody talks about it. When nobody talks about it, nobody asks questions. When nobody asks questions, they get to play with all of the fancy toys that the aliens are dropping off. What if contact is about to be made? Do we know? Is that part of the secret? Because up until four or five years ago, there was really no reason for this topic to go mainstream like it has. And the only thing that we could sit here and do and shrug our shoulders, say, well, that's a little bit different. That's interesting. We know something is happening. We know there's information going on. We know there are scientists working on this technology. What we don't know is where it's happening, how it's happening, why it's happening, and where did the technology come from? Sure, we could hear people say, oh, they're interdimensional. They're from a different timeline. They're from inner earth. They're from outer space. We really don't know. We could only assume, but the American government may know. The United States military surely knows. And they are going to keep it as secret as possible. They're telling the politicians right now, hey, go take your money and become rich from your lobbyists. Or do you remember how many contracts that your state has to build military products? Let's remember that. We don't need more politicians like Harry Reid coming out way after the fact. What the American public needs right now is they need more Tim Burchett's and Senator Gillibrand's stepping up to the plate and saying, tell us what we need to know. Because this is still the question that affects every single person on this planet. Not every American, all 7.8 billion of us. And that is your Dave 101. All right, let's get to Shirky Poo's news tonight. Starting off in UFOs, according to two former Defense Department of Defense officials, the Pentagon, yep, the Pentagon again, office recently tasked with assessing U.S. military encounters with UFOs, is woefully ill-equipped and improperly staffed to tackle its new mission. Moreover, the initiative threatens to derail a congressional proposal that would mandate unprecedented government transparency on UFOs. 
Lou Elizondo, the former head of the informal defense department unit that assessed military UFO reports, states that he has had deep conversations about the office of the undersecretary of defense for intelligence and security. That's O U S D I and S leading a government effort to investigate the phenomena. According to Elizondo, your foes are not solely an intelligence issue. If we want 70 more years of secrecy on this topic, the OUSDI is the perfect place to put it. They've had four years so far. What we have little in the way of efforts serving meeting the public interest. Thank you, Lou, for calling it out. I love that he's becoming a little bit of a media jerk and a thorn in the side of the government here. I like this new Lou. New Lou is cool. He seems like he's one of us, one of those badass uncles that you call on over when the bully at school shoves you down in the school hallways. Yeah, he's that guy, Uncle Lou. Let's call him Uncle Lou from now on. I can't say much about experiences as an intelligence officer, according to the writer here, Eric Hazeltine, PhD. But I'm going to read it in his term. But one thing I can say is I constantly got the question from friends, are UFOs real? My answer was usually an enigmatic smile, which implied I knew more than I could say, but which in reality covered up the total ignorance of the subject. UFOs, ETs, alien abductions, and visitations were not simply subjects of the intelligence community or what they cared about, despite the public's occasional obsession. But now, yeah, everybody's looking. Everybody's looking, including Eric. Thank you, Eric. Hazeltine for your duty. Here's a cool one. A comet will fly in the sky around Christmas, and we're not talking about Santa's reindeer here, but keep your eyes out for the giant ice ball called Comet Leonard that is soon to become increasingly visible from Earth through the months of December as it heads towards the sun. Named after astronomer Greg Leonard, who discovered it in early January of this year, the comet is expected to sweep closest to Earth on December 12th, becoming viewable for space spectators watching from below. This comet will fly in the early morning sky, but is visible in the evening as well, similar to Neowise, which I never got to see. Leonard is considered a much-anticipated comet that is likely to be 2021's best comet and its brightest comet by year's end, according to EarthSky.org. That is very cool. All right, let's get to another one here. All right, breastfeeding in public, I have zero problem with this. Zero. A mother should be able to feed her child anywhere, especially her baby. Little older children, a little weird at that point. But a woman who took a Delta flight recently wasn't kidding around when she whipped out her boobs and started feeding her hairless cat. Hairless cat. The unidentified female from uh, Syracuse flew down to Atlanta where she caught where she was caught breastfeeding her feline on the plane. A flight attendant told her to repeatedly to stop and put her cat back in its cage. However, the woman refused. A message was sent through the aircraft communications addressing and reporting system to alert Delta crew in Atlanta that a passenger seat 13A is breastfeeding a cat and will not put the cat back in its carrier when the flight attendant requested. A photo of the message was found on Reddit, posted on Twitter. Flight attendant Ainsley Elizabeth, who was on board during the incident, took to TikTok on November 13th to explain what went down. This woman had one of those like hairless cats swaddled up in a blanket, so it looked like a baby. Her shirt was up and she was trying to have the cat latch onto her and she wouldn't put the cat back in the cage. And the cat was screaming for its life. My goodness, torturing the poor kitty. Elizabeth revealed in another video that security got involved. However, she was unsure of what happened to the woman once her cat and her touched down with the jet in Atlanta. The Delta employee who sent the iCars message also requested that Delta's red coat team apprehend the woman once they got to the ground. Red coats are the elite airport's customer service experts identifiable by their bright red coats. They are specially trained to handle on-the-stop customer issues, including ones that try to breastfeed their cat on an airplane. There are some sick people out here, man. Sick people. I don't get it. Shirky Poo, where do you find these stories sometimes? Breastfeeding a cat on a plane? It's terrible. Who does that? Oh, my gosh. Let's wrap this thing up, man. 
Thank you, Shirky Poo, for the news. Thank you to everybody listening to Dave 101 and to uh, uh, Stephen Ward for coming on in and kicking some butt talking Mothman and Dogman all night long. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brothers watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your car, wherever you're breastfeeding your cat tonight. Thank you to everyone in our chat rooms on YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyrighted by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we're watching. We own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the woo train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Be careful with your cats. Good night. Well, that audio went off without a hitch. Look at that. Some bitch. It worked. There's there's super quiz. Horns up, you bastard. Come on, give us that extra, Captain, you prick. Oh, yeah, I can see it right now. Come on, you son of a bitch. Get it over with already, you jerk. Uh Uh-huh. I can see it. Friggin' awesome. One second here. I got to figure out how to do this now. Okay, we got to restart this. There is apparently... Some update and restart there. Let's move this over here to the dome. Push that there. This goes up here. And the show's being downloaded there. We don't need that anymore. We don't need that. Hold on. Stop everything. Shirky Poo's message. I knew Dave would like that story of the lady breastfeeding her cat on the plane. As if those hairless cats weren't creepy enough. Breastfeeding it in public? Yikes. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Even Nicole Sackage. This lady needs to be arrested for bestiality. My goodness. Who just, like, who does that? I'm curious. Like, who does that? I don't get it. Not my thing, man. That's one tea party I don't want to crash. <laughs> Scary. Scary. All right, let's it's almost rock here. Scary times. Holy cow. I did, Lawrence. Your package is already sent. Hi, lovely Lavira. How are you? Mike L., good to see you. 
I did see the gorgeous Heidi around here somewhere. Uh, one day we're going to get Zochitl Paez on the air. KJ Hawken, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Who else showed up late? Derek Ning, how are you, buddy? Good to see you. Looking good there, Super Duke. Looking real good. Just so you know, everybody knows, when when Duke from World Bigfoot Radio goes out looking for Sasquatch, he always wears brown leather chaps with stirrups. It's true. He showed me the pictures. I was mortified. Totally mortified. Mortified, Steve. Acreong, how you doing, buddy? Mr. Lurks a lot. Oh, my God, those levels are beautiful. Those levels are beautiful. Hold on, I got to see how this sounds. Let's just, where's the beginning here? Okay, there's the beginning right there. Boy, that's tight right there. How the hell did that end up so tight? Wow. See how this sounds. Please check the use for Okay. So I need to go to, where did I do this? Options, audio. Uh, this is gonna be voice meter, I believe. Okay, so if I play this, okay, use open options using tools, options, tools. Options, audio, voice meter, or USB audio codec. Okay, I've done that numerous times now. Audio. No, that's not what I need. Speakers. Should be that one. We're going to have to get this thing going. Just bear with me here. 48, good. General playback for all this audio here. Sound play device. Try that one. Nope. That doesn't work either. Sign of a default playback device. Let's try that. Play Double theory. They would. Uh, right. create car crashes and, and uh, make people stab each other and so forth. <coughs> All right, my friend, we got one minute. Can you okay. guys hear that? 10% happier by visiting Chai. there up there let's do this thing all right now we're ready not yet i'm just gonna move these over replace all right let's go 
here. Home. Copy. Paste. <clears throat> that song will do that. The theme song will do that. All right. The beauty of having a powerful theme song, that's for sure. Are these updates done on this computer now? Give us a minute. We're updating Microsoft Teams. Should be ready to use again shortly. Okay. Whatever your Microsoft Teams bullshit is. It is. Uh, I, I is into very much looking forward to having you. Yeah, to you listening around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair. Okay, whatever. They can have that. That's a little hot. We'll, we'll improve that for tomorrow night. Okay, so we got to go about there. And then we level off. Then we're good. Sorry, I'm talking to myself here. Yep, out the field, Duke is Chap Smith. Super Duke is Chap Smith. Okay, any questions, comments, concerns? Anybody want to ask any questions? Fire away. I'm good for it. I do have a cool theme song, not going to lie. All right, there's number two right there. Cut. Second file, number two. Where does the white go when the snow melts? Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've been... That does sound good. Though. Best levels I've had in a long time. Fuck. It converts to water and liquid doesn't have a... Water doesn't have a color. Unless you're in Flint, Michigan. Or during runoff season. Runoff season's disgusting. All right. Any other questions besides snow melting? There. Once again, we ask that after the show, you leave a comment below on the video. Tell us what you thought about tonight's show. That really helps us out. Got some new swag up at the store again today. Uh, when are we going to have Jonathan Davies back on? Whenever he feels like getting up for it. Uh, Chop Shop, you're a little late on the horns, buddy. You're a little late. Airless Primate, how you doing? Uh, do I think ETs have set a deadline? Yes. I think it's, a, it's uh, in 25 to 30 years. Maybe as soon as five years. Nicole and I have talked quite a bit on that subject, actually. Um, here's the thing. Oh, Thurston Howell the uh, Third. There is on our website, Zark. And uh, it's also posted in the Spaced Out Radio group. 
and on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, it usually comes out every Saturday to Sunday. But the website has it all. Website's updated up until the week Sunday right now. Anyways, what was I going about to say? Um, yeah, Nicole and I have looked into that subject a little bit in regards to why now. That that is the big why now is the biggest question that we need to keep asking. Why now? Why now? Why now? Why now? Mr. Ian, how you doing, buddy? And when I look at everything that has come down over the past few years, the only thing that makes sense to me is that a date was set. Uh, Dave, can you make a t-shirt with the SOR background with the cryptids? Uh, I can try. I don't have the ability to do that. But I know people who do. Yes, I do. Okay, is that it there? I think so. Yeah. There is no reason... Jill and Charlie, how are you? There was no reason four years ago for the To The Stars Academy to come out. And if anybody believes that Tom DeLong put that team together in order to bring transparency and ufology and bring the truth out, that's just a bunch of horse hockey. Didn't happen that way if you talk to insiders. Um, Tom just took all the credit. Not by his choosing, but it's just the way it is. And he's stuck with the story. So, anyways. I believe four or five years ago that there may have been a contact made that gave a date. That's my opinion of what happened. Because otherwise, what we're seeing today and what is happening today makes absolutely zero sense. No sense at all. Good comment, Mr. Ian. Tom was the experiment. Lou is the reality. I agree with that. What they did was they saw that he had two and a half plus million followers on social media, and that was attractive to them. Them being the alphabet agency that wanted to slowly start to get the trickle of this story into the forefront. Gorgeous. Deanna's Vlogs. How you doing? Good morning, Magnus Ver Magnuson. Panther Piss, where have you been hiding? Where have you been hiding? Oh, I like Tom's music too, Brazelhoff. He plays an ugly Gibson guitar, that's for sure. I don't like his guitars, they're ugly. But... 
I like his I like his music. I like Blink 182. Wish he would go back. And God bless uh healing to Mark Hoppus, the bass guitarist for Blink 182, who is battling cancer right now. It is a uh, nice headstock on those guitars, but the body is ugly. God, it's ugly. Let's close that out. Oh, there's John Davies right there going. Oh, very cool. Here, I thought he was messaging me privately. No. Chad Smith, what do you want to link for? You are so Chad Smith. Hold on. Such a Chad Smith right now. <clears throat> You're not even online. Hello, Sophia. Black Op Technologists. What did you ask to, but forgot to caps? Nicole, should we start reporting our, should we start reporting our sightings to foreign countries databases to cause attention? That's actually an interesting question, Nicole. Very interesting question. I don't think that's right, but I think, um, I think it's going to cause a little bit of an uproar. Most Americans start reporting their stuff elsewhere. Look who it is, people. What's going on, Dave Scott? Why are you using my name? It flows off the tongue better. You know, it's a better name. You got to go with the better name. Hey, how's your audio? Do you have any problems tonight? It's perfect tonight. I just got to get used to the levels. 
I can't hear you for some reason. It's really quiet. Hold on, hold on. It's my it's Mr. Cowley. There it is. Welcome no, back to the show. Take it, Chad. Oh, Mr. Cowley. Loves his spaced out radio. That's nice. That was very nice. Yeah. What are you Man, doing? By the time my head hit the pillow, it took like two seconds and I was completely, I was out. By the time I got done with the audio test. Dude, we worked hard on that today, dude. Yeah, that was cool. Got her done. Chuck was a machine, man. Chuck is very good at what he does, especially when you don't have stuff in front of you to work with. You're just doing it all oh, off yeah. pictures. And... Cheers. Had to make some coffee. Look at this. The ladies are crying happy tears for you. Look at gorgeous Julie Rios. Well, weep. It's Chad Smith. Well, hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the Chad Smith Podcast. My name is Chad Smith. Today is December 2nd, 3rd, December 3rd now, 2021. I'm going to bring in my special guest, Dave Scott. He's been the uh, audio and video guy for a long time here, and he thinks he knows what he's doing on the radio, so we're going to bring him on in. Uh, he's just gonna keep me on here. You notice my changed my uh, <laughs> look at the upper right corner. Oh, that's awesome! I'm Chad Smith. I don't even have that on my stream yard. I'm gonna have to right get there, that. buddy. Right there, oh, I'm Chad Smith. That's cool. It like blends in. Oh, I'm Chad Smith. How did that even happen? How did the whole Chad Smith thing even happen? You tried to take credit for it the other day, you jerk. That's because I don't really remember exactly how it even happened, so I have to just make stuff up on the spot. No, 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 no. You you tried to take credit for it. You were in UFO Garage one time, and I came in there and I said, Hi, I'm Dave, and you said, Hi, Dave. I said, I'm Chad Smith. Yep, that's right. That's how it started. And I said, No. I'm I'm Dave Scott, if you're going to be Chad Smith. That's how it started. Look at even Wes is Chad Smith. Wes H., what's going on, man? What's going on? The gorgeous Mel Melissa Nicole wants to know, how was your nap, Chad? <laughs> Melissa, my nap was very good. I had a UFO garage dick pillow next to me, and everything was good. And the lovely Lynn LeBlanc is like, Hey, at Chad Smith, cutie. Ooh. Mm-hmm. I don't even I need to be on camera for this. Oh, yeah, I need you on camera. No, no, no. You just go, bud. You're my co-host. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, I had to play Spooky Song again today, and I asked Sonny if I was going to get in trouble, and he said that you love me and you wouldn't, you wouldn't mind. No, it's free to use. Okay. It's only the spookies Lynn, in there, though. Melissa is saying, I'm Chad's fake ass eyebrows. Wow. Wow. He's so stunned. He's frozen. <laughs> I thought we were friends, Melissa. This is hor This is This is terrible. I thought we were friends. Okay. Just going to have to cross her off the list. Okay. Yeah, no Christmas card for Melissa Nicole. Just saves me more money. Uh huh. I want to know what you're getting me here for Christmas after making you a star. I owe you a signed picture that's supposed to go right there behind your head, and I just I'm procrastinating. I'm waiting. Well, when you send me a Chad Smith shirt, I'll send you a Chad Smith picture. I'll send. It was up on the website. Uh, no, Ben hasn't put it up yet. Okay. <clears throat> Did, ben hasn't it, put it up yet. Is it a new design or the same design? Uh, it's the same design. I got to think of something else here. There is one that I want to do that I have in my head. I, just, I, I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. Hmm. Um, 
Yeah, I don't either. I just tell Ben what I have in my head, and all of a sudden it's there. I'm like, huh, yeah. I don't have that talent. Uh-huh. That is not one that I was born with. I'm going to send you uh I'm waiting, man. I'm waiting. All right, so that's all done there. Let's close that out. <sighs> Mr. Cowley. Welcome back to the show. Oh, oh Mr. Cowley. Loves his spaced out radio. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Did he come into the chat tonight? Uh, we are going to be making I'm Chad Smith t-shirts. Oh, yes. a mug would be perfect. Then I could have a Chad Smith coffee mug instead of the UFO garage right, I'll one. Make it. I'll go make it right now. Hold on. Let me uh, Let me figure this out here. <laughs> Um, I finally right. had to wash my UFO garage hoodie. I've been wearing it nonstop, and so I, I've had to take a break on mine too. <laughs> mine started getting a little stretched out. Hold on, where it? There it is. Hold on, I gotta sign into something here. Okay. Simon Wales says I'm a dinosaur. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Does that mean I'm old as dirt? Simon, come on, man. We're, Simon fr- we're friends. That. Simon says, I'm a dinosaur. Wow. And Brassel, hey, does Chad Smith like UFO Garage? Just a little bit. I like Ben's logos. And Ben does so much for everybody. I just have to Ben's represent a, him. Ben's a man. He's a. He, Seriously, he's he's the man. Yep. <clears throat> yep. He's pretty cool. Let me see here. Julie says I'm gonna say goodnight until the into the morrow, until tomorrow. Sweet and useful dreams, everyone. Good night, Julie. Thanks for hanging out on the Chad Smith podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Welcome back to another episode of the Paranormal Chop Shop. My name is Chad Smith. Thank you so much for being here with us. Oh, man. We really You're do appreciate it. With it. earning your You're listening running. ears. <laughs> Stealing my intro, everything. <laughs> uh. All right. I'm so taking this one. And John right. Hudson. <laughs> This is boring. Who are these bozos? Who's that? Who said that? John Hudson. Oh, that hey, that's a fedora wearing John Hudson right there, people. You cannot buy those in stores. Hold on. Thank God. Oh. Oh. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> John, get in here, man. We need some conversation. Oh, I'm not staying up late tonight, man. I gotta go to bed here in a little bit, but John will keep you up. John is the band. He is. John is a beautiful version, and I mean this with all due love and respect. He is the human of the. He is the version of the human rain delay. The human rain delay. <laughs> he just keeps going and going and going and going, man. I fucking love him. Yeah, he's awesome. He's so smart, dude. He is so smart. It's very sickening. intelligent. It's sickening. It should be illegal to be that smart. It's crazy how much time, I mean, it takes a lot of time to bring in all that information and retain it all. And Oh, tell me about it. He's very good at what he does. Yeah, he is, he is brilliant. <clears throat> Who said that? Brassel that I like UFO Garage? Look at this on my phone. Where the hell did that picture go? I'm going to have to go back and get it. Now I need uh, some SOR stickers. No, Melissa, I'm not singing over here. No singing on this channel. Except for Mr. Cowley. Free download. Yeah. All right. I like this. Saved image as. 
<coughs> Where's Sonny Conway at? He's in the chat room hanging out there somewhere. Sonny Conway. Little Sonny Conway. All right. Mm -hmm. Let's go like this. Uh, let's go. Sorry, John, you deserve it. Um, <clears throat> now we're gonna plethora have to of fedoras. Rotate this just a little bit. Hashtag fedora of reason. I like that. <laughs> fedora of reason. <clears throat> All right, so I'm going to rotate that. Now. I just got to figure this out here. Hold on. Crop picture. <clears throat> Background, upload picture. Start. Nicole, what are you talking about? She says, I'm impressed, Jared. Where was this on the panel? Where was what? I'm not singing or anything. Oh, um, yeah. No, you're she, talking. She just that, means that, talking. That's the thing. You're talking. That's what she means. Talking into a microphone. Lord knows you weren't talking. <laughs> uh, this is what I like talking about. I'm have a, I have a hard time talking about the politics stuff. And you're like, Chad Smith, what do you think about that uh, congressional hearing? Wrong way. That's going to be minus profile. There we go. Welcome back, Chad Smith Podcast. All right, we're going to save this. Dave, I will happily take a spaced out radio pillow instead of a shirt if you're being generous. No, no, I'm going to I'm going to put that in PNG. Download has started. I think that's going to go now. <laughs> All right, so where the hell did that download to? Download has started. Paul's been playing hide and seek with a four year old all afternoon. Coach Clearfloss, how you doing? Yeah, he's probably been rocking with his grandkid. <laughs> That's probably a never ending job. <clears throat> all day. Really? It's still downloading? PNG. What time is it? Is Taco Bell still open? Nope. Hold on. I gotta see where this went. God damn, I hate it when that happens. Oh, bear with me. <coughs> uh, no. No. Where the hell is that? <clears throat> Brian Bland's still awake. He's sending me all kinds of Bigfoot pictures. Sasquatch, pic Sasquatch pictures. Okay, I didn't want it there. I just want to move it. Close. And Smith hat. Open file location. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, dude, this is going to look badass here. John says, Chad Smith wants a body pillow with Dave's full-scale image on it. <laughs> I don't blame him. I really don't blame him. I'd be one comfy guy, man. <laughs> All right, let's see if this works. Full-scale. <laughs> Out of my store. Let's find a white T-shirt here. Add product. You know, we'll put it on a hoodie. Put it on a hoodie right there. Start designing. What the hell are big oven tees? I don't know. I'll Scale. never forget that night when I was at work uh, 
working on a job change and you you were just like, you know what, I'm just going to see if I can get this design to work here. And that's when you made that wrench design. The wrench was awesome. awesome. Yep. I'm like, what is he doing? All right. So let's just, what is that? Hooded sweatshirt right there. That's what we want. So let's go big oven tease. What the hell? Preparing the editor. Add your design. From my device. See if this will work. Come you have on. seven times more people watching you design a Chad Smith shirt than I do with Brian Bland on there. <laughs> it's awesome. There we go. The Chad Smith hoodie is uh, being published right now. We'll add Mr. another product Cowley. to that. We're gonna need some t-shirts here. We should make a let's let's go to unisex shirts here. All right, what do we got here? No, I don't like that shirt. Well, oh, what the hell? It looks good. <clears throat> the dream junction. I had some ideas for um our Keith Andrews if he ever wants to come up with some merch for his channel. You should get a shirt with the three karmic laws on it. You're going to love this, man. Honestly, you're going to love this. It, 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 this is actually kind of badass. All right, I'm excited. You should be. I'm pretty excited about it. Right about there. Save product. Publish. I'll show you right now, dude. It's coming online here momentarily. <clears throat> okay. 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 Oh, look who it is. My co host. Oh. All right. Check, on, this, check this out. We got new stock in the store. It should, it should it should even back out the more we talk, Sony, I think. Your computer's just not used to our audio coming through for a second. Look at this, buddy. The new Chad Smith t shirt right there. Oh man. <laughs> Hold on, I gotta zoom in a little bit. That's awesome. There's the new Chad Smith <laughs> t shirt right there. <laughs> Chad Smith. That's pretty cool, man. That's one of those shirts that when you wear it, unless you're a fan of the show, people are going to have no idea. They're going to think that's for the Chili Peppers. <laughs> it's it's okay. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right there. <laughs> the Chad Smith t-shirt right there. Yep. That's 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 kind of cool, dude. That's your hat. <laughs> it is. That's awesome. <laughs> Chad Smith t-shirts. I've made it. I finally made it. <clears throat> Don't piss off KZX. There we go. Ben's, uh, Ben's going to log in there and be like, what the? what is this? I didn't make that. No, uh, I'm trying my best. I'm not very good at it, what he does. Oh, I don't think I've met anybody that is. He's pretty damn good. Yeah, he'll probably have to go back in there and clean them up a little bit. Mm -hmm. That is a good shirt, though. I have the same issue that you do with that white box. Every time I make something, there's like a white background. It's like it in PNG. It's supposed to go nothing there. I don't understand it. With a transparent background, yeah. I don't know how to make something with a transparent background like that. I'm so buying one of them Chad Smith t-shirts, man. Uh, Lunar Eclipse, how you doing? Bryson West, good to see you. Terry and Al, Spirit Stalking, what's happening? Welcome to the channel. Who else do we got here that's uh, hopped on in? 
Grand Paul Holland. Welcome back to the show. Oh, Grand Paul Holland. Loves his spaced out radio. Nicole says, I'll put some coffee on and pull an all nighter if Dave stays up too. Dave's got one more day of work before his weekend. Doris, how are you? Welcome to the channel. Hello, Deanna. There's a lot of people still in here. I got That's right. I got some. In- Jesus Garcia, what's happening, buddy? Are you Jesus Garcia or Jesus Garcia? <laughs> Let us know. Because Jesus Payan, I thought was Jesus Payan, but it wasn't. It was Jesus. Yes, Anya, that's what I was telling Dave. He's got seven times more people in here just listening to us designing T-shirts and stuff than we've ever had in our chat rooms. Dave is the podcasting hub. Allergies got me. I am the hub. You're the hub of all the other podcasts. Yep. We're going to do another T-shirt, too. It's just going to be... From knees to feet of hairy legs, we're going to call it the Nicole Sackett Street <laughs> Theater. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> uh, Bryson, Chad, what... how, can you, how can you donate? There's a little number sign down below. Oh, God. Big Willie's coming in here now. Mm. Hey, Dave. Mm. Melissa said she was just on the website and she was going to buy the shirt. And it says, sorry, it seems there are no available payment methods for your state. Please contact us if you require assistance or wish to make alternate alternate arrangements. What state is she in? North Is it North Carolina or South North Carolina? North Carolina. North Carolina? Carolina. She said, I was about to fix it. Tell Dave to... Or I was about to buy it, so tell Dave to fix it. That's a... <laughs> I'm throwing That's a little a thing. I'm throwing Davis a little stank on it. Uh, hmm. We got some cool swag up there right now, dude. I, I can s- one. I can totally see you in that big bomber jacket <laughs> with the shoes. At the next, I conference. love the shoes. I'm gonna buy myself the shoes. Those chucks. I like the chucks in there. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm. Speaking of conferences, we're we're gonna have to talk to you about uh, organizing a Michigan. It's happening. A Michigan conference. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. They all need to be smitten by the mitten. Come on now. I'm UAW. <laughs> I can get a UAW hall rented out. Oh. For free. Oh man. Yeah, we'll party hard. Real hard. Till they till they find he's Canadian though. Will they let the Canadians in? Will they let them? In? I don't. I don't think so. Not at the UAW hall. Oh. No. What foreigners. if they come in there like, hey, listen, what a mission from God, huh? What maybe. Is, maybe if we Dave, put a big American flag shirt on them. What's Sammy Hagar's bar in Vegas? <laughs> what's that called again? Cabo Wabo. That's it. Hey, Jonathan That's Davis. Cool. It's kind of the same thing here, too. But I'm curious, what is it in the UK? Uh, I never saw it clear there. Uh, I'd say, hey, Semper Fi to our favorite veteran, Black Dragon. Welcome mm-hmm. in late, gorgeous oracles and beyond, lunar eclipse. Uh, hold on one second. There's gorgeous uh, adventures with death. Uh, Bryson, I, I have not seen it pop up yet. If you did it through YouTube, I've not seen it pop up. Hi, lunar. No, Beth, I'm not oh, singing. It wasn't me by Shaggy. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> I say we aim for like 2023 and try and and try and get a UFO conference at Sammy Hagar's bar. <laughs> Dave, that would be so awesome. He'll go, Dave. He'll, oh yeah, he'll, he'll totally go. Mm-hmm. He'd be like, "Wait, what? Who booked my bar? What's going on? <laughs> what are they talking about?" It'd be good times. Cancel Based all my what now? Based out who? <laughs> Love it. 
Oh, man. Oh, my God. <sighs> Jonathan Davies. Small cock. There. <laughs> <laughs> Big Willie, small cock. <laughs> Big Willie, small Love cock. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Oracle's and beyond. Man, Oracle's, I feel like it wasn't that long ago we were talking, if you think about it. It really wasn't even that long ago. Like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So what'd you think tonight, Dave? You enjoy yourself? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I love cryptid guys like that. And also I was telling Lynn, because she said cryptids are her kryptonite. I'm like, I freaking love kryptonites. Or kryptonite. I love cryptid stuff. Because they're such one-offs. Except for like the big three, right? Like your big, well, even really your big four. But most, because there's some bizarre cases out there that just, they make zero sense when you hear the accounts, you know? Or they're, they're similar-ish. I guess to be fair, I guess there's six or seven that are repeats, but there's so many just bizarre uh, encounters that I don't know. They fascinate me simply because we won't know one way or the other. Dave is warming up for Santa. Hey, Nicole, by the way, I did message you. I don't know if that date would work for you or not. No big deal if it doesn't. We'll work something out. But uh, maybe if you get a chance, I'll let you check that too. Why is Nicole up so late? Did did Fat forget to bring her cookies again? Did you forget the cookies? <laughs> she says as long as Dave's staying up, she's going to make some coffee and stay up. I'm only oh, going to stay up here for another 12 minutes. That's what I figured. That's okay. We'll hold down the fort for you. I know. It's 4 in the morning here, Dave. What are you doing? Let's go. It's time to party hard. Yep. Don't when we come to Canada, me. you're not sleeping. Uh, yeah, right. I slept. <laughs> Dude, my son woke me up at 8.15 this morning and says, Hey, Daddy, aren't you going to take me to school? He was supposed oh. to catch his bus at 7.55. Oh. <laughs> well, looks like we're playing hooky today. <laughs> well, I got him ready and made him breakfast and got him to school for nine. <coughs> Good dad. Dave's a sheep squatch there in West Virginia. Yeah, you guys have – West Virginia is just an enigma in and of itself. That whole area along with the lower part of Ohio – it's just filled with just strangeness all around. Morning, body tech. <laughs> it's only 1949. <laughs> <laughs> Keurig is making its second cup of coffee. Guys, I feel like we came in here and we did we drag Dave down? Did we bring down the energy? Oh no. Do we There's, need to turn this energy I, up, guys? I'm What's still trying to on? catch up with all this chat. He's got so many people in here still. Before I came in here, Dave was at an all time low. <laughs> He's at an all time low. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I mean if, if you get more Chad Smithy in than this, mm. I mean <laughs> just put, you know, he just put me right in my frigging corner. I heard him in there. We don't do Canadians around here. Well, that's a shame. <laughs> Chaz is taking over the channel. This what? is the second time today. He put me on full screen, so I just started acting like it was the Chad Smith podcast. I did see that. There it is. Welcome back to the second half hour of the Chad Smith podcast. My name is Chad Smith. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today with Big Willie and... And thanks for that, Chad Smith. Now we're going to pass it right back off to Sunny over there with the Paranormal Chop Shop. What's the weather looking like <laughs> hey, these days? Hey, guys. We got the chopper in the air with the weather coming up here soon. But we're going to come at you with some more commercials from uh, Willie. We don't have no sponsors. We're hey, in trouble, Ma. guys. <laughs> Let me tell you about Hey Ma. If you're wondering about Hey Ma, check out Chad Smith. He'll tell you about Hey Ma. What's that cat doing over hey, there? Hey, we need the meatloaf. We want it now. Come on, Ma. Oh, don't no, don't be pulling that Giordano crap around here. <laughs> oh, wait, is that a thing? That guy yeah. doesn't get to take the credit for that. No, no, no. That video existed That's way Ferrell. back. That's original video. YouTube stuff right there. I would yeah. My uncle. yeah, but he's all over that. We don't want to promote any of that crap no. on here. See, I've never watched him, so I wouldn't know. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Every <laughs> time. You don't want it. Apparently he's got all the cool sayings, though. Every time I say something, I'm getting in trouble for it. I've never heard of the guy. Yeah, that's a I didn't, that's a Michael Rappaport thing, I thought. Yeah. 
That's what I heard. I thought those were just my uncles. The freaking <laughs> moose. It's just a moose. <laughs> Call the FCC. <laughs> All right, we gotta stop. By the way, Dave. This is a serious yeah. conversation. <laughs> stop it. <laughs> You're not gonna <laughs> stop. This is why Dave gets to do radio and we don't. Oh, he can definitely make a yeah, <clears throat> do a serious conversation. Yeah. I love it. Dave's like, hmm, that's what I do. You Who still are... holds the SOR record? Uh Luis Elizondo holds the record for uh four hundred and fifty five. 455. Yeah. Damn. Not doing a man bun. Why does everybody want to see me in a man bun? I'm not doing a man bun. I saw it earlier. Yeah. It's not a man that. bun. I just had my hair up. Tomorrow's hair washing day. Call it what you want. <laughs> oh my God. I Look saw here, it. With unibrow. My... Oh my God. <laughs> I oh, saw it with no. my own two eyes and my unibrow. You know what? I'm going to make a Chad Smith unibrow t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you guys. Chad Smith <clears throat> cut out in the eyebrows. In the eyebrow right there. Nicole says you're going to have to design a broken shaver for my t-shirt. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh man! Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna get a pair of clippers and put Nicole's name on it. <laughs> you guys are too much. Or a pair of pruning shears, one of the two. She may have branches coming out at that point. <laughs> oh my! Dave. God. Come on, Willie. You could laugh. It's okay. <laughs> He's reading the hat. You had a man bun last hey, week. I'm, Dave. I'm keeping it together. Have a man bun. Better than I did with Lynn. So, <gasps> Spooky. Well, he said soccer What's bun. Up? I don't know what that is. <laughs> What's up, Spooky? Welcome back to the show, man. Doris, don't you dare. 4 a.m. Good night, y'all. You quitting early on us like that? Doris the bird Hi, Doris. is uh, going to bed. I wonder if mm-hmm. Doris. I wonder if if the if the bird Doris the bird's humans know that she's <laughs> figured out how the computer works and listening to this show. Hey, we don't care as long as you subscribe, like, ring that bell, and share. Yes. We're all about it. You got one more week into freedom, buddy. I know, I know. Then it's then it's no more fun. Then I got to go in here with with Dave. And Gemma Jade and John Hudson and put on a show for you guys. I guess we're gonna have a good time. I'm gonna entertain you now. So I'm just gonna have to entertain everybody. Uh, I mean, you oh just can't God. Chad Smith anytime you want now. My no. freaking God! <laughs> I love Chad Smith. Sophia's like Sophia's like who? Chad Smith? You don't know who Chad Smith is? Don't worry. Everyone knows the Chad. Well, open a paranormal shaking out. shack for all of your poltergeist needs. <laughs> that was pretty good. That was pretty good, actually. Oh, man. Terry and Al want to open up a paranormal chicken shack for all your poultry dice needs. <laughs> chicken shack. That's awesome. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Uh, D... Dijo Zed Roach. <laughs> that's not a UFO. I have over 2,000 hours of training in this field, and that's a balloon. What the hell are you talking about? <laughs> are they talking about the box on the uh, from the show earlier? On the stream? No Thank you, Doris, for subbing and liking. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, man. What if they're really We got a new one. Doris the bird. Heck, yeah. Shit. Now, if Doris the bird could only get the rest of the humans in the house, maybe the cats and dogs to hit subscribe too. That'd be kind of cool. <clears throat> Subbed and liked. Spooky, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Yeah, if you could try to like show a little support here, Spooky, that would uh, help it out just a little bit here at the channel. Show a little bit more support to the channel, please. Everyone's you know, liked it, but you tonight. If my Birkins can make thirteen accounts, so can you. For Christmas this year. Don't know how I'm going to get down there anyways. 
no desire, but my dad sends me, my mom just got out of the hospital, right? So my dad sends me this photo. They got one of those chairs that goes up and down the stairs now. You know, the, have you like seen those? Gremlin movie. Right, where you sit on the chair and then it takes you up mm-hmm. the stairs. So my mom, my mom is using that as of today. It just got installed yesterday. <clears throat> I'm like, damn it. As I try to really, really perfect laziness, <laughs> I may go to my parents just so I don't have to walk up their stairs now. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Can you imagine just sitting down? All right, I'll be there in a minute, Ma. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it makes it sound like a roller coaster. Oh no. <laughs> There's still 126 people in here watching. Dang. I know. I always feel Simon bad. Wells. That many people. The question is, how many of them are sleeping? We don't care. We literally <laughs> Wake don't up! Care. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really. look at this, Nicole. I haven't slept since I was replaced by. Oh, Lonsley. now listen here. Let's oh, play nice. No. Across your beard, buddy. So here's the deal. That was a uh, that was a sort of my fault. There's a lot going on at the garage sometimes, and <laughs> uh, it, it, and and the boys at the garage are are, are long term improv planners and. And the planning of the improv wasn't planned out properly, so yeah, yeah. But Mr. Lovelace, you know. <laughs> but I'm for sure getting you on. I told you January, unless you want to do. I didn't do um, Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. But if you were open that, we could get you in soon. That, but that's why January seventh. Yeah, we doing. probably got all those days open. You could Nicole. get Nicole in. Yeah. We would never bump you, Nicole. <laughs> Listen, I didn't. To be, to be fair, there was a vote, okay? And, and I didn't really get a vote. <laughs> there was a meeting, and there was a discussion, and it was me listening. <laughs> Big Willie's so. trying to save his brand so hard right now. No, no, we're all in the garage here. That's true. It's getting it. shorter. It's red. There ain't nothing left short to go about that. It's gone. Mm. Oh, man. Simon, guys, what are you talking about? Do you guys know who I booked for December 14th? Dan Aykroyd, and I'm freaking psyched. I'm psyched, boy. It's going to be a good one. I, I mean, seriously, when you sent him that message, have you sent that to Dave yet, the message you guys sent out to him? That he should... <laughs> I did. <laughs> Can you, you play did? That? I did when he was talking about him last yesterday, I think. Oh, oh boy. Man. I don't think he listened to it. Hey there, yeah. Mr. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd, this is Sonny Conway. <laughs> <laughs> Over here at the Paranormal Chop Shop. <laughs> oh, geez, Marge. Oh man! You know it t- takes a lot to uh, get Nicole Sackage pissed off. You're in her bad books right off the bat. Oh base. no, hey, listen. dude! Man. Nicole, I will, <laughs> I will, I will send you a personal reading of whatever you'd like, one chapter from your favorite book, and I'll just read it to you so that you can listen to it to go to sleep at night, and it will come for you. Okay, one chapter. In your time in need. You got to give her at least three chapters, dude. Hey, yeah. I'm running a business over here, Dave. I've never even read three chapters. <laughs> oh, man. 20 we'll minutes worth. We'll keep it 20 minutes. With Willie's voice, I'd be passed out. Yep. See, that's the weird part. That's the weird part. Some people say that, but then, like, they still listen. And I always wonder when they're listening, when they're actually doing a show, I'm like, are they just sleeping? Like, are they definitely there just, like, all asleep? And they come back out of the end, like, good job. Great show there, guys. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone, you every like, one, you know what one trips me out is I always wonder if they're because a lot of people use different names or nicknames on their channel that you would never know who they are. I always wonder if there's like somebody famous watching. Hmm. Like, I've thought that like, too. Like some maybe music star, actor, athlete that uh, comes on and and just listens to the woo. Doesn't Steve even Buscemi. Chat. Ooh, come on! That guy's <laughs> awesome. I'm telling you though, Dave. If you could, you know, like throughout history, right? Somebody who's passed away, a famous comedian. Who who is one that you'd want to interview? Like, if you could pick one, who's your go-to? Oh God, it's a toss-up between 
between uh, Chris Farley. Oh, yeah. That's my guy. <coughs> and John Candy. Hmm. Same. Or Richard Pryor. Chris Farley. Oh, oh man. Richard Pryor. Mine was Chris Farley and uh, John Belushi. <laughs> Terry, I'm really George Clooney. Shut the French toast up. Bill Hicks? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, Chris Farley for sure. Like, come on, that guy partied hard, right? Like, we know he partied hard. <laughs> like, really oh, hard. yeah. Harder than most of SNL, probably. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's so funny because, like, there's stuff that I don't really cry at too much. Like, movie-wise, my wife would be crying. I was distraught when Chris Farley died, man. The 98? Yeah. Were you even That's born? Oh. oh, yeah. I think it was 98, right? Or 97? So you were, like, four? <laughs> I was about to say, we, were, we weren't even that old. Chad was, though. Chad I was, was eight. Yeah. Seven <laughs> or eight when he died. Uh, 94. Oh. oh he died in 94? I was three. Beth, Robin Williams would be mm, top nice of the list, too. I feel like Robin Williams is the kind of guy he could just hang out in here with us. And... <laughs> Black Dragon is Keanu Reeves. I just watched The Matrix tonight, guys, <laughs> for the first time since 2003. I'm not going to lie. The, the graphics held up pretty well. At first, going into it, I was like, this is going to suck so bad. And the graphics actually held up pretty well Yeah. for the time and era. And uh, what a great concept to really make you look at things i mean there was like ridiculous amount of slow motion that it was unnecessary and plot holes but the overall running theme of that 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 story is pretty uh i don't know on the face value of it you can get really lost in it i think hey grantavius thanks for hanging out with us while you were driving for three hours oh, wow george carlin and robin williams Mm-hmm. oh man that would be good ones who do you want to meet in the UFO field? <clears throat> Bob Lazar. That would he's be a, a good one. He's a Michigan guy. He doesn't live too far from us, actually. Really? He's not he's far. He's sweet, though. What? He's a Spartan. Is he a Spartan? Hey, how about that? How about the Michigan boys over there, huh, Dave Scott? How about them boys over there in the blue, huh? What about, how about those the amazing Wolverines, huh? There, but the... How about those Wolverines there, bud? Well, those Buckeyes kept their hands at 10 and 2, just like the record on the way home. That's right, boy. That's right. <laughs> just like the record on the way home. <laughs> Come on, even the state troopers trolled them. God, you guys have no idea how long, how miserable that's been for us. It's terrible. Hey, Finally every down. dog has their day, but it's the true. Ohio State Buckeyes <laughs> will always, always, always up on the winning side of that record. Hey, Google, what's the most win- winningest team in college football history? Fresno State. Here is some information from the web that might possibly help. On the website NCAA.com, they say, Michigan is the winningest program in the history of college football. Huh. Well, at least so they can't say that. To the you're a bunch of bandwagoners. <laughs> How, oh, no. How much did you have to pay Alexa to say that? <laughs> That's no, my Google. Over here. I don't have Listen, to pay him anything. I've been a Lions fan all my life. You want to talk about being a, ba- a bandwagon fan? Listen, Ooh, I'm let sorry, me tell man. you here. I'm sorry. I know the Lions prepared me for life. It kicks the crap out of you, but you come mm-hmm. back every time. You're like, this is going to be the years, boy. How can this you can continue <laughs> drafting so high? <laughs> and I mean, between, between them and Jacksonville <laughs> and... And uh, and Cleveland, how do you have that many top ten picks in a row, and you still can't field a fucking team? Yeah, the the Fords, you know. Uh, yep. What's her name <laughs> Betty or something? I mean, she kind of she actually did more than he ever did, to be honest. Because all they did with him was would we would draft quarterbacks or completely terrible wide receivers that were you know every one of them, every one of them were a bust. I don't know how we managed it, but we did. <laughs> We did. Simon, I almost just spit my coffee all over the computer. <laughs> um, I love that Nicole is bringing us back on topic here, though. How many views did Corbell have four years ago? What is? Wait, wait. Maybe I misunderstood what I was reading. I thought she was saying Barely she wanted to talk to him. It wasn't until he got uh, he got uh, affiliated with George Knapp that all of a sudden mm-hmm. <clears throat> he took off. You know, I have enough hair. 
to fill all three of your heads. Hey, that's facts. Mm-hmm. Facts. Mobile head Sunday there. <laughs> you didn't even see me the other day when I typed in the chat room. Sonny has an oval head. When you were on with see that one. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't see that one. Sonny's got an oval head, huh? Sonny's hey, got son that. Uh, Sonny's got that uh, that homeless brother Jason Statham look. <laughs> that's like a cheap man's Jason Statham. Statham. Oh my god, that's perfect. You could cosplay the crap out of him, honestly. Just go with the full uh, five o'clock shadow. Do weird scenes where you just look. You know, they count his punches in movies. It's written into his contract. His sister literally counts punches. He has to have more punches than a bad guy in every scene. Oh, boy. This is a real thing. Hell of a That's... guy to work with, I'm sure. Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, it oh. says here that I've only had 46 punches, and this guy over here, who nobody knows, has 52. So we have a problem here. <laughs> That's going to okay. be a problem. Breach of contract. My, fa my favorite Jason Statham movie is Death Race. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everything is just so intense with him. Could you imagine? It's like, uh, what's the guy from Hell's Kitchen? Gordon yeah. Ramsay. Mm-hmm. Damn Brits. I've never had chicken like this before. Did you pull it out of the ground? <laughs> what Gordon Ramsay's chicken awesome. out of the ground? Ted Smith, you haven't That's how missed dry a chicken dinner in years. Huh? You haven't missed a chicken dinner in years. <laughs> oh, my God. Hey, if it's hot and ready, I'm eating it. <laughs> oh, man. Banner Smith, how you doing? Love Mark Longoria, one. good to see you. <clears throat> Dave's just making fun of me because I haven't had a home-cooked meal in probably five years. You know, it's kind of funny that you bring that up, though, Dave, about like who would I want to interview. They're, honestly, some of the ones I wanted to, and for some people, they might be like small fry or whatever, but I, I was really excited to interview a Lorian Fenton when I did hers. That was one that I really wanted to do. Which I know, like, for a lot of people, they don't really know, maybe, or, like, whatever. But I really enjoyed that. I just, to be able to hang out with her and chat was it was a good time. How was your interview with Nicole? Oh, that got canceled. That's <laughs> right. I know. Hey, listen. It's not easy over here. Okay? We try. That's so I'm, that is, the van. I'm booking Nicole. Before, before Saturday, since this is a Canadian program, <sighs> what are you doing with the Stars and Stripes there? With the Stars and Stripes? We always got the stars and stripes up. Where's your maple leaf? Man? Don't so, you, you don't see me rocking old, old maple leaf there, do you? <gasps> oh, man. Oh, man. Hey, this this goes back to what my brother and I were originally. These colors don't run. That's right. We uh, <laughs> band of bearded brothers from back in the day. I feel bad for people who find that, by the way. And I, I don't understand. We haven't put out anything in months, and I'm getting more downloads now than when we were putting stuff up. And I'm like, guys, please stop. Oh, look at this. She's putting it on me now. I only said yes to you because Dave asked me. Ooh, wow. wow. Salty. You, Man, Nicole. You better, you better get rid of Terry Lovelace. That was a <laughs> it's good not my guess. Hey, listen. I can't help that the boys got J.J. Bone and Terry Lovelace down there. The, the Texas Santa Claus. J.J. Bone. <laughs> that guy, he's a character, man. He's I love trip. listening to him. I would almost maybe... I don't know, Dave. I mean, what, what do you think? Would J.J. Bone be a fit? Like, come on, maybe? Who's he's J. interesting. He's, he's, he has like a... I don't know if he actually... Yeah, I think he works for the radio there in Texas. He does like kind of what the garage does like a little bit, but like paranormal, just a little bit of whatever. But he's got a really fun personality. He's pretty, he's pretty entertaining. You know, when you have fun personality, you look like Chad Smith. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm all about fun personality. And Nicole, here's the deal. No matter <clears throat> what, once you're there, it's you and I, you get one-on-one -on -one attention, okay? There won't be, like, multiple other people in there, and, like, maybe I let you talk. I I've already booked you and her. I. You're, you already had your chance. I just booked <laughs> her. I just sent her a message on, on Facebook. Sweet. We've already <laughs> stole the one from Willie. Remember, he didn't take that <laughs> too well. Wait, which one? Uh, did we get? Borrowed. Kira. Good all? Kira. Oh, that's true. That is true, you did. <laughs> that is true. Hey, Sonny, remember when we had that guy, uh, Jim Goodall on? 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> Michael oh, oh, That was the same day we had Michael Shratt on. No, yeah. there is one. There's one that you guys should probably well, head back on again. You should have seen Ben, Joe, and I partying with Michael Shratt. Because, you know, Michael Shratt's a little stiff, okay? He's a little... <laughs> and we had him so drunk. Oh, man. Uh, I, he was a few in, and, and I'd That's be like, awesome. I, I can't believe it's Michael Evan Shratt, man. Because <laughs> I idolize the guy. I absolutely idolize the guy, right? You know, we almost had him dancing on tables. That's a good night. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good night. I want to be there for one of those nights. I got to call the shot here, boys, because Mm. old Davey's got to get up in the morning. Uh, Big thank you to Ben. Can't even see that far. Smithy and Surf Jair for the amazing super chats tonight. Really do appreciate it. Thank you on all the new subscribers. Thank you to Big Willie's Beard, to Sonny's Goatee, to Chad's Oval Head. <laughs> appreciate each. <laughs> That's it. Appreciate each and every one of you. Dude, Tomorrow night on the show, oh, who wants to board the Woo train with me? Because it is our Keith Andrews. And, and, Nicole, if you want to come on my show, you are more than welcome to at any time. And I know you enjoy our Keith Andrews, and you can co-host our Keith with me tomorrow. I would never kick you out of a, out of a, out of a show, Nicole. No, I would not do that. You know, not like this guy here. I'm going to make sure I, like, copy and paste the section and send it to Ben and Joe and be like, I just want you guys to know. Yep. Just want you to know. <laughs> I already sent her a message that says, Hey, Nicole, my name is Chad Smith, and we'd love to have you on with us over at the Chad Smith Podcast if you'd be so kind to grace us with your presence. <laughs> you you got your choice of you got your choice of two. You can do paranormal chop shop too if that's too early for you. Oh yeah. Absolutely. And you still get yeah, the Chad Jesus. Smith. Hey, speaking of that, if you guys want to follow the link that Chad just put in the chat there, uh, there'll be an after party continuing on here where Nicole and I will sing a duet together. <laughs> just you I'm can... signing up for that. How do I get there? <laughs> do you up for your uh, after party? We can let you come too if you want, Dave. So yeah, I'm heading to bed. I'm heading to bed. All right. Uh, Spooky Morales, Mr. Spooky, he's Hope good you got at it. That trumpet ready to go. It is, it is that time once.